Hello and welcome here at the EAO channel live. We're about to get ready for an exciting session here at the EAO Congress in Lisbon, which is titled, Should We Avoid Implants in the Aesthetic Zone? And for the next 30 minutes, while the coffee break here in Lisbon is going on, we will look forward to that session, kind of prep you to see why it is important to discuss this topic. And I will not do that alone. I'm proud to be honored uh, to be joined by uh, Professor Dr. Stefan Fickel from the University in Würzburg. Stefan, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here, Garrett. Definitely. Now, together we will look forward to that session, which is chaired by Irina Saylor and Isabella Rochetta. And we have two speakers today on stage. Homa Zadeh from the United States and Marcus Hursler from Germany. And they both will debate whether or not we should avoid implants in the aesthetic zone. And since this session is live with you on the EEO channel on YouTube, anytime, whether it's during the conversation that Stefan and I are having or during the session on stage, you can send in your questions via chat and we will ask them to the speakers because after they have done their session in the auditorium, we'll bring them right here downstairs to actually do a debrief and answer all the questions that you might have. And even if you are looking at this session in recording, still type in your questions because we'll find a way to get them answered. Now, Stefan, if we read the session description, it ends with a very, very challenging question. And let's start with that one. You might have an impor important person in your life. Are, y are you married? Yes. You're married, happily married. What if your wife would need an implant in her aesthetic zone? Would you do that? Gerrit, are you really starting with the most difficult question from we the are. onset? We are. Um, this is a tough question because it obviously combines all. It combines the emotional things behind it, but it also combines a strive for the best result, maybe also not on the short term, but on the midterm and also on the long term. So um, maybe just to answer that in a nutshell, um, I would definitely choose the appropriate treatment in the selected case. So, and again, we're coming on the outline of the session. This might differ from the zone in the posterior, molar teeth, premolar teeth. This might differ to the anterior zone. This might also differ uh, from, the, from the age of, of the person, maybe a young person. I would try to, to gain some time before I, I place a definitive treatment. If I have an older patient, maybe my mother or my grandmother, I would definitely be a little bit more aggressive in that perspective. But I think you already see some controversials which may come up in this session. Yeah, well, to guide our viewers into the session, let's start to explore the dilemma here a little bit. Because why is it not a simple yes or no question? Can you highlight some of the key dilemmas that clinicians and, and, and dentists should consider before choosing this treatment, especially in the aesthetic zone, eh? so the, the, the teeth that are always in the smile? Well, the outset is clear. If we, if we look at the scientific data, I think both treatment options, or not only both, but there are definitely more treatment options if I consider ortho, autotransplantation, whatever. They seem to work quite well over time in a trained hand. And this makes the dilemma for the clinician very clear. So if treatments seem to be the same, what kind of option to choose? Yeah. So I think we don't have one treatment which is sticking out which is sometimes suggested a little bit when it comes to dental implants, because a lot of times you hear dental implants are probably the best choice, more predictable. But if you clearly look in the literature, also in the scientific feeling that a lot of experienced clinicians get, they will tell you there's not so much different when it comes to the midterm or long-term prognosis of both of these treatments. So I think from the onset of our discussion, we should be clear that it is, th from, a, from a scientific base, there's no yes or no for one or the other treatment. And that makes it open for a clinician to choose. Exactly. There's no difference if we look at clinical outcome. Right. But there's other stakes at play here, right? Of course. Because why, why is it preferable? Why would you choose for an implant in the aesthetic zone? I think it is a very important development we see over the last 10, 15, 20 years in, in, in dentistry is like, 10 years ago, we always talked about evidence-based medicine, evidence-based dentistry. And we always were looking at numbers. And this treatment is 0.3 millimeter better than this. But on the, on the patient hands, it didn't make a big difference. It didn't make a, a really big change. So 
today, I think also your clinical experience, patient reported outcome measures, like the patient satisfaction, like the maintenance, the, also the money involved, I mean, we will discuss also about that, yeah. plays a role. So you're right, from evidence-based perception, of course, you can choose. But when it comes to your clinical feeling or your clinical expertise, it depends on where you're experienced with. I mean, in, in Germany, we have a saying, if you have a hammer in your hand, the whole world is, is a nail. Yeah, yeah. So if you're experienced with one procedure, you might prefer it over the other. And I, I guess this is what we will also see in the session. Yeah, so then it's a matter of preference, it almost seems, however, if it was that simple, we would just have a session on how to place implants in the aesthetic zone, but that's right. not the title. Right. It's literally saying, should we avoid? So let's explore the other side. What are the key risks here then when we place implants in this zone? I think one thing has to be made clear from the, from the beginning. And you read the title, in the aesthetic zone. So there seems to be a special problem with this anterior zone, aesthetic zone. Yeah, um, what is that? Yeah, the problem is that in the posterior zone, implants may work very well. And we also can do procedures which may not be affiliated to complications. We can maybe place a short implant or we can accept a bone defect and place the implant deeper. I mean, you wouldn't want to do it in the aesthetic zone. Exactly. If you have a major bone defect, of course, and if it's my wife, I, I wouldn't dare to place the implant a little deeper and make her a one meter long crown. Yeah, so because it would show probably on the lip or anyway, it would not be pretty. Absolutely, so of course, besides the functional perspectives, which, which an implant obviously has, does it work? And, and of course, the functional perspective is, can I chew on it? And does it have no inflammation? I think a third uh, perspective comes in the aesthetic zone into play, does it look good? Yeah. And not does it look good from a dentist perspective, but that does it look good from a, a patient's perspective? And again, the, a, another uh, factors come in, into play because it's not only uh, the, the red aesthetics, so the gums which play a role, but it may also involve a great lab technician. I mean, there's a tooth on top of it. Mm -hmm. So you, you also need to have access to a, a skilled lab technician who, who makes a, a perfect crown blending into the other teeth. So yeah. you see that the, 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 the a lot of more variables come into play if you look into the aesthetic zone. I always compare that with a plastic surgeon. And I mean, they have this dilemma every day because the patient comes up to you and says, I want to have that wrinkle corrected. And, and if you tell them, and if the wrinkle is still there, and you, if you tell your patient, well, that's the only thing I can do. He will not be satisfied. Exactly. Yeah? So this is the dilemma we see between posterior zone, where a patient is, is interested in function. He, he will be happy if he has a tooth. In the aesthetic zone, the patient will not be happy if he only has a tooth, which is maybe longer and has a gray shade or whatever. Exactly. So, so you say the stakes are higher. It, it requires more skill. It requires more preparation. So a proud dentist would say, well, this is the ch Champions League of implant dentistry. Come to me, I can do it. Are there other risks involved, except for the fact that we are playing on a, on a high level field? Well, of course, if you want to reach a certain goal with your restoration, there are more factors involved because you have to do more surgery. Because most of these cases, you have a bone defect. And we, I guess we will see that. I mean, you're not taking out a tooth without any reason. So there's always a reason for this, this implant or for this indication. So this may involve more bold surgeries, saying to build up more tissue. And again, every experienced surgeon knows that. The more you push the envelope in a surgery, the more complications you see. And again, these complications, they will be very difficult to tackle in the aesthetic zone. So, of course, as you take more risk in the aesthetic zone to get a great result, you also may end up with more complication, which, which sort of uh, make a problem with the whole result. Exactly, they, and they can be all over the place. Right. Yeah. So this is a little bit the dilemma we see um, if, if we talk about the aesthetic zone. This is, I think, what I want to hear from the, from the speakers is, um, well, are we skilled enough or do we have these technologies, maybe also in these two skilled hands? Is it predictable to place an implant and to make it nice again? 
or are you backing up? In also in your experience, and if we will hear this from our speaker, these are top renowned international world-class uh, implantologists. So if they will tell you there are certain indications where I back up, I mean, as a general dentist or as, a, as an implant surgeon who is not so experienced, you should listen up. That's an important takeaway. Now let me address, if you're just joining us, we are live on the EEO channel, getting ready for an afternoon session here at the Congress in Lisbon. And I'm joined by Stefan Fickel, who is my expert co-host, and who also guides both you and me into an after chat, a debrief, a live Q&A that we will have with our speakers after they are done in the auditorium. And I see that we have some first responses here. Right. Unfortunately, I'm not capable of reading Chinese, uh, Chinese names but it looks uh, like a Chinese literature, and they are uh, waving at us. So uh, thank you all the way from the Far East. I, I think we should say good evening. And also to our audience here on site, glad you're here. If you have a question or something to uh, add to the conversation, raise your hands, I'll come get your question. Now, Stefan, we've kind of explored some key risks. So the question in the end is, clinicians, dentists should learn from this session when they should go for an implant in the aesthetic zone or not. Let's elaborate, elaborate a little bit on the alternatives. What if we say we're, we're a bit risk averse, conservatives, what can we do before we decide to go for an implant there? Well, of course, you always have alternative in, in medicine. And of course, alternative to implants, I mean, is to save the tooth, if the tooth, tooth is still in place. And I think we overlook that sometimes when we, when we see the innovations which we see in the field of implant dentistry, um, we also should see that in the other fields, like periodontics, orthodontics, saving teeth, there are also innovations. I mean, they also grew better. So um, I think, well, the first alternative, if the tooth is still in place, would be to keep it, to do any measures. Anything before you go to, yeah. Because there's a nice saying, it takes a dentist to lose a tooth. Exactly. So it needs to be pulled actively. So yeah. you don't lose it just on the street. So this is a, a, a decision a dentist takes. It makes more sense to take out this tooth and place an implant. So of course, if you, as you alluded to, if you back up and say, let's go back to that decision process, um, I think you should start there. I mean, the tooth is still in place. Is there an option to keep it? And of course, parentology is something we should talk about because most of these cases are perio cases, advanced bone loss, inflammations, endodontic problems. So, I think we should look into that field again, and maybe if, if we are not qualified to do that, for example, you're not a periodontist or you're not an expert in, in, in endo, ask an expert. I mean, send over that patient and, and ask them, is it reasonable for you to keep that tooth or is it reasonable for you to do your measures in your field to improve the prognosis of this tooth? So I think that would be the first alternative if we discuss that is, Keeping the tooth. Keeping the tooth and do anything at stake and actually get other experts involved to see if there's other treatment options. However, one more point comes into play. If you're, if you're working in your own private office um, and the patient pays a lot of money for that, I mean, this also comes into play in your decision-making process because if you're my patient and I will tell you, you have to invest an X amount of money and after two years, Garrett, I am not sure. No. I mean, maybe the money First is we gone. Try the one round, yeah. Maybe the money is gone, and we have to start the whole process again, starting now with the implant. So, you see, this is not only a, a discussion which is, is led by, by clinical experts, so, but this is also a discussion which I need to see on a patient base. I mean, there are patients telling me, oh, Stefan, do anything. I mean, I want to keep this tooth. So, I am a little more into that direction. Yeah. But there are also patients telling me, I mean, come on. Take it out. Quick. Well, they, they will not tell you take out the tooth, but they will tell you do one procedure which works in your hand, and I don't want to have this procedure done in two years or in three years again. You see, I mean, I, I'm not saying that the, the patient should guide your, should guide your indication or your treatment, because this, this should not be the case. But of course, there are different types of patients With for different, different indication or preferences, as you alluded to. Exactly. So, do anything to save the tooth. Right. If we come across a case where the tooth is already out or there's, there's no way saving the tooth, do we have other in-between options? Right. 
I mean, dentistry is a very old discipline, so of course we have very classical work. I mean, classical bridge work and, and, and classical uh, pros work. Um, this also needs to be decided because um, if, if you lose a central incisor and um, you, you have the decision to make an implant or not to make an implant, I mean, to make a bridge is very, very, very predictable because I can tell you, uh, Gary, this definitely will work. And I, I will need two appointments, maybe three appointments, and you will have a bridge. Okay. So, however, I also will have to tell you, if you have healthy neighboring teeth, I will have to grind them down. Ah, and yeah. they will have a certain risk. I, I wouldn't say losing them, but of course, seeing morbidity on that teeth, endodontic lesions and whatever. So, all good so things have a bad exactly. side. Well, that's what we're trying to explore and discover uh, right now. If you want to join in on the conversation, please use the opportunity to chat live into this studio. You can do it now in my chat with Stefan or also during the session on stage, which we're about to follow, or even after, when we get our two speakers right here in the studio. Now, Stefan, let's look forward a little bit to the speakers that we see on stage, because going through your history, your personal history, we see some cross linkages. You right. actually seem to know both Thomas Ade from your time in the US and Marcus Hussler. What, what can you tell us about them? Well, I know both of them very well. I mean, Marcus is a close friend of mine. I worked together with him for more than four years in Munich. Uh, Homa I know from, from my time in New York. Um, I already can give you a taste what you will probably yeah. expect, what do you expect because there will be a difference between the ocean and there is a difference. I mean, uh, the Homa Ameri being from the United States and Marcus being from Germany. Yes, right. let's explore. Um, there will be, of course, a tendency for someone coming from the US being a little bit more aggressive. Why? Because I, this comes back to the discussion we had because patient wishes and also maybe liability may exactly. play a bigger role in US. Yeah. So try to do something and not be completely sure what kind of result you receive might, may be a problem in US. And, and, and this might also be one of the soft factors why you decide to take out the tooth and place an implant because it's probably on the short term or on the midterm, the definitely more predictable approach than saving a tooth uh, from a periodontal standpoint. Mark um, is definitely a, per a periodontist. He's, he's a periodontist, also cross-trained as a prosthodontist, uh, experienced implant surgeon. So he probably knows all the world and has been long enough in that field to see your own complications. and. I think this is also a, a very important point. I mean, if you're fresh in that area and you look into your cases uh, five years down the road, I think your decision might be clear. It is an implant. Yeah. But, I mean, we will see probably patients 20 years old, 25 year old, three, uh, 30 years old. I mean, if I just come up how long this implant has to stay in the mouth and how long it has to look good, this might be 10 plus years, maybe 20, 30 years. This might change because we, we haven't discussed about that. I, if I can raise that point again, uh, when we are talking about the long term things, I mean, there might be deviations in the jaw. So this also needs to be addressed when we talk about this. For example, a good result on an implant may not stay a good result because the implant is ankylosed and the teeth, they might move. Yes. Because earlier you referred to science and the scientific research and you said clinically there's no proven difference in outcome. But to what term? I mean, what do we good know point. about the long, long term, right? Very good point. Very well and, 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 and good prepared point. I cannot argue with that point because we don't know. I we mean, don't know. No, we what really is the longest? Do you know approximately the clinical study that we've seen? Uh, definitely we have studies looking over 25, 30 years into implants, however, not with the aesthetic perception. Ah. This is interesting. Exactly, because, because they just measured the functional mm, presence. They said, okay, the implant is still in, in place, it works, it has no inflammation. But this is not what we've been talking about today, because um, if you have an implant which is in function but doesn't look good, it might be a failure in the aesthetic zone. At least in the perception of the patient. Absolutely. Yeah. And, but, but you as a clinician, you have to anticipate that. I mean, 
no, no patient will, will be happy if you tell them, well, it is also integrated, it's fixed. I mean, what is your problem? So are you saying that from an academic perspective, we're researching the wrong metric? Is there any research being done in, in valuing the aesthetic outcome? Actually, it is done and, and, and studies come up. However, I think, I mean, let's be fair. I mean, we can always say where there are no studies, but I think this aesthetic perception of implant dentistry um, has not been the focus. I mean, it, it, it grew into the focus over the last 10, 15 years. I mean, let's put it like this. We, we had to take care that this implant is stable. Yeah, first we need to make it work. Right, yeah, yeah, and yeah. Um, I think this was the work which had been done by, by, by the professors and, 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 and the pre-runners. And now as we see, okay, it's quite predictable to get an implant also integrated. We can look into different factors, and one of these factors is definitely the aesthetic perception of a patient. So there are studies up and running, but um, to my knowledge, um, it is it is very short-handed, and also and definitely not long-term. So definitely not long-term, and and also this aspect which we discussed is like the deviation of the tooth length because of changes in the bone. It has not been elucidated too much. So. This is definitely something, um, but, but actually, which is, which is not too bad as a clinician, because again, the decision, it lies on you, and, and it will make this session so much open, because um, I, I guess no one would be really wrong or, or, or right, because there's no difference from the literature short term, and if we, if we place aesthetic parameters into our discussion, we don't really know. Now, thinking about the aesthetic zone, the front of the mouth, everything being so much smaller in dimensions, what are our opportunities to go back in later? So what if, after 20 years, I come back to you, my implant is either aesthetically or maybe even functionally there's a problem? Do we have room for a rerun? It's a very good point. Um, I think, of course, there is room from the prosthetic components, and I would always allude that, that you work with implants which are on the market and which are well researched and which which keep the parts like an old car. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, very difficult to get the parts again. And this is the same. But but imagine you come to me and and you have an implant, which which I do not know, which which actually has no parts available anymore. And I have to tell you, Garrett. I mean, if we want to restore it, we have to grind yeah. it out and start from scratch. I mean, how how bad is that? So. For me, the, the first thing would be if you use an implant and if you use an implant in the aesthetic zone, mostly in rather young patients, make sure you use an implant which will be available in, in, in 10K or in 20 years and in order to re-restore it. Of course, if something goes wrong, you can re-restore it. This always depends on if the implant is still healthy. Yeah. And let's say, I wouldn't say that we don't know, but it is, of course, if, it, if I look into the literature, uh, some studies, not too much from the aesthetic zone, but we see that some of these implants might not be totally healthy after these time points. So it might then be a, dis a discussion. This might be also a part of our discussion now is what to do if it fails. Yes. I mean, yes. I have to do a re-restoration, which is probably the most difficult thing in medicine or in dentistry. Yeah. So basically, and then we're back to the beginning, where you said, as a design principle, try to save, the, that's your stand at least, try to save the tooth as long as you can, because even if you go in with the implant, in the long term, a re-restoration is like your worst possible scenario. I mean, that's what, what everyone will tell you also if you talk with orthopedic surgeons. I mean, they have this problem also. I mean, they do hips and knees and whatever, and the patient will ask them, how long does that last? Yeah. And they will tell them maybe 15 years or 20 years you will have to have a retreatment and they will tell you the most difficult thing is a re-restoration that is the same in our situation i mean if you have an implant which has a defect or which has a situation which is very very difficult to to treat the most difficult thing is to retreat it and to get a good result again because mind one thing i mean this area is pre-treated. Also, surgery has been done. I mean, tissue changes if you do surgery. Exactly. For example, if I place an implant, I do augmentation procedure, I cut into the tissues two, three, four times. Tissue changes. Yeah. So you have more scarry tissue, 
the risk for complication in your retreatment, it increases again. Exactly, exactly. Well, Stefan, that is very great. If you are just joining us here on the EAO channel, I have been talking to Stefan Fickel, who is a professor at the University of Würzburg, and we have been previewing the session that you're about to follow live in the auditorium, which is titled, Should We Avoid Implants in the Aesthetic Zone? Session is, is chaired by Irina Saylor and Isabella Rochetta, and you will see on stage Homa Zadeh from the United States, as we learned from, uh, from Stefan, they might be a bit more aggressive and say, well, no problem, I'll show you how to do it. And then after that, the second speaker will be Marcus, Ho Marcus Häusler from Germany, who will actually probably root for the fact that you should be very careful and take us along in the risks. Now, the beauty of the fact that this session is live, if you're watching and recording, just replay and watch our conversation again. But if you're with us live right now, you can send in your questions to the speakers or to Stefan. I can see that here on my laptop. Ah, and here's actually just something happening. It's Luis Pereira Azevedo from Madrid. Good to see you, Luis. Thanks for participating. This is just proof that we are live as it gets. And you can participate, send in your questions, because we will get our speakers back here in the studio right after they've done on stage, after they are done on stage, and take your questions on your behalf. Now, Stefan, in the last few minutes before we take our viewers up, you are also a member of the EEO Junior Committee. Can you elaborate a little bit on what that committee does in this association? It's a very important committee because our goal is, of course, junior. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm still a junior, but let's <laughs> fresh. Let's allude You're fresh. To, uh, <laughs> fresh. Yes. Uh, let's allude to that. Um, so our mission is, of course, to, to bring new ideas, to bring these kind of things into play when it comes to digital, social media. Um, but also our task over uh, the last years is to sort of change the style of sessions also to make a little more interactive session to have the speaker discussing to have cases shown and a third thing which is which is a very important point which we start to do over the last years is we bring the EAO, EAO in different countries so okay. what we have for example last week we had in Germany a big annual congress and we had an EAO session ah, together okay. with the local society and that of course also promotes the EAO and, and makes sure we, we see young people coming to the congresses. So if anyone watching, either here in the congress in Lisbon or uh, back in the office online or at home online, how can people become a part of the junior committee? Uh, committee? What are the qualifications you need? Well, it's a little bit strict, to be honest. I mean, we, we have um, board members, um, and only one from every country is allowed. So in order not to speak the same language, I guess, no. But um, these are the regulations. So I would, if, if you're interested, uh, we will now have three open spaces where we will do the interviews uh, at this Congress. But there will be open spaces, of course, over the next year. So I would recommend you to look at the homepage, uh, to look for your nationality, look for the nationality of the board members and see what spot could be a good spot for you. And then you, you, you see a lot of interaction with other board members and uh, it, of, of course, makes you grow as a person and a clinician. Perfect. Well, thank you for elaborating on that. And thank you for joining us live here on the AEO channel. It's a quarter past three. It's time to take you upstairs into the auditorium. But make sure you hit the YouTube subscribe button right now so you'll be the first to know when a new video comes out or when there's a new time we go live. And we hope you stay tuned all the way till when are they back? Quarter to five, in 90 minutes, we have the speakers and Stefan right here in the studio. And we'll do a debrief and live Q&A, hopefully with you too. Looks like the session is about to start. Let's go upstairs. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. 
And thank you for coming back so numerously. It's wonderful to have such a full auditorium for this really exciting uh, session that my dear colleague and friend Isabella Rocchietta and myself will moderate. My name is Irina Seiler, and we will hopefully have a very, I would say, interactive, oh, exciting, wow. surprising session together with the two speakers. I would say that is a guarantee given uh, the two amazing speakers that we have the honor and the pleasure to host today. And I must say, not only they are exquisite surgeons, they are dear friends. I think they are on the top of the mountain, <laughs> the Everest peak when it comes to surgical skills, when it comes to treatment planning. And I am sure that we're going to have a beautiful, beautiful uh, afternoon. Their names are Homa Zadeh from California and Marcus Herzler from Munich. So today we have a really interesting uh, afternoon. I would like to remind you that this session will be live broadcasted on the EAO channel. So please follow us on the EAO channel on YouTube. And after the sessions, the two speakers will join Garrett our wonderful host and, and, and uh, journalist, who will bombard them with questions coming from all around the world. We would also like to remind you and also ask you to send us your questions, any questions that you may have during these two lectures and the whole session. Yep. We will do our best to address the speakers accordingly. Well, the two speakers are two experienced speakers. Just slightly. Yeah, they just started a couple of couple months on stage ago. Some time. the first step, which is risk assessment. So by doing a risk assessment, we can understand the elements of risk and how they contribute to the success or failure of our cases. So what I'd like to discuss with you in the short period of time that we have are the important areas of risk assessment that we've learned about 
with regard to implants, especially in the aesthetic zone. Very often, as the case that was shown uh, for you right now, is that when we are treating implants in the aesthetic area, we're usually replacing teeth. So we're transitioning teeth to implants. So we have to understand what happens during this transition from teeth to implants and what happens to the biology of tooth extraction socket in this process. And Lin uh, Lindy and, and Araujo really started this field with their understanding and doing the histology of uh, extraction socket and introduced to us to some of the biological phenomena that occurs during the process of tooth extraction healing and basically uh, demonstrated very clearly that there's significant atrophy of the alveolar ridge that takes place after tooth extraction, specifically focused around the facial aspect, and they estimated around two and a half millimeters of remodeling of the crest on the facial side. We've done some of our own study with a non-human primate model, which is actually closer to the human situation to understand the biological steps that take place after tooth extraction. So in this model, we basically uh, took the pre-op CBCTs, post-op, and then we focused on the area of the tooth extraction alveolar bone, and we took that area and we basically segmented it digitally to understand what happens to the remodeling in each of these segments. And what we found is that actually in the very crest of three millimeters, there's about 70% loss of the alveolar bone. In the segment directly above that, you have about 40%. And then once you get into the basal bone, it's much more stable. So this really illustrated that the uh, degree of remodeling is actually greater than what was illustrated in the uh, canine models. Well, one of the areas of major contribution to this are the studies of Shapui, which demonstrated by superimposing immediately post-extraction to the heal sites after eight weeks of healing, what happens and what are the risk factors for remodeling? What they identified is that the thickness of the facial bone is critical to the step. So they identified two distinct phenotypes of the bone of our patients, those with thin and thick phenotypes. So when they actually tabulated the results, they showed that their data segregated into two distinct populations. Those patients that had a thin bone phenotype where the facial bone was a millimeter or less, these patients had more than 50% of that facial bone completely resorbed. Versus those patients who had the thick bone phenotype, those that had more than a millimeter thickness of that facial bone, there was very little remodeling that was very stable and maybe 10 to 20% remodeling. So this, I think, was a major contribution to our understanding of the risk factor for our patients in terms of the bone phenotype. But actually, uh, prior to that, the studies done by uh, Mariano Sanz group in Madrid in, in uh, immediate placement illustrated the presence of this bone phenotype, showing that those patients with a thin bone phenotype, also when you place immediate implant, they have much more resorption. So placing the implant doesn't seem to somehow alleviate the bone loss that occurs, and that thin bone phenotype is still a risk factor when replacing immediate implant. What uh, Daniela Cardiopoli did was also very interesting in this area, also confirming the presence of bo different bone phenotypes, thin and thick bone phenotypes, when we're doing extraction alone. But what Daniele did was to perform rich preservation, graft those sockets with bovine and organic bone. And what he found is that those sites that had gra been grafted, they basically behave like a thick bone phenotype. That really, the degree of bone remodeling was limited and behaved very similar to that. 
So it shows that if you're extracting teeth, if you have a thin bone phenotype, there's going to be tremendous resorption. If you place in the implant, if you have a thin bone phenotype, there's still going to be tremendous resorption. The only same thing that seems to counteract some of that resorption appears to be grafting the socket. So this is a very important observation. Also, this particular study by Hugo de Bruyne's group showed the negative con uh, factors in the healing of extraction socket with rich preservation was the location of the tooth. Central incisors and canine, those that have very, very thin phenotype, those areas actually had more resorption than laterals and premolars. And what is also important, that facial dehiscence was a major risk factor in the remodeling after rich preservation. And this, again, the studies by uh, Mariana Sanz group, they found the negative uh, factors for immediate placement where anterior teeth behave worse than posterior teeth, and smaller gap distance between the implant and the socket wall was a negative a predictor of outcome, and then having the thin bone phenotype that was less than a millimeter. So these are important risk factors to keep in mind if we're doing rich preservation or immediate placement. So immediate placement and implants in the anterior area get a bad rep. Why? Because there's frequent recession as a complication. So what contributes to that? This is a study that uh, identified some of the most important risk factors for mid-facial recession. Uh, and what they found was that the most important predictor of recession in the mid-facial area is the implant shoulder. Those implants that are placed too far facially are 17 times more likely to have mid-facial recession. So who can we blame if there is mid-facial recession? Can we blame the implant, the patient? No, we can blame the surgeon because of the position being the most important. So what came out of the studies from uh, Mariana Sanz studies was this multivariate analysis of what should be the optimal position of the implant in an extraction socket. And I think this is one of the very important factors that clearly showed in a scientific evidence-based manner how we should position our implants in a three-dimensional basis. So bear with me for a second. So on the x-axis, you see initial vertical position, either subcrestal or supercrestal positioning. And then on the y-axis, you, sh you show how the bone healed relative to the platform of the implant. Either the, imp uh, the bone was above the uh, platform of the implant, or was there were some threads exposed. Ideally, we like the bone to heal at the platform of the implant. So this is our ideal position. So based on how we position our implant horizontally, that could dictate the 3D depth of placement. So if you place the implant right up against the facial plate, you should place it two millimeter below the crest because there's going to be two millimeters of crestal loss. If you place the implant two millimeters further back toward the palatal, then you only have to place the implant one millimeter deep but if you place the implant four millimeters from that facial plate, the implant could be placed equally crystal, and the bone is going to heal that way. So when we're looking at that, if you place the implant right up against the facial plate, you're going to lose two millimeters of that facial bone. That's not a good idea. So if you step it back two millimeters, you have to place it one millimeter deeper. But if you place it four millimeters to the palatal, it could be at the level of the crest. But the biology is not the only determinant. Because if you place it too far back, then you're going to have to deal with the prosthetic contour that can become an issue for us. So one thing that actually the Hugo de Bruyne's uh, group demonstrated is that we can also take into consideration the mucosal phenotype in our planning of the implant. What they showed is that the thin mucosa is a risk factor, and if you have thin mucosa, there's going to be increased bone loss. So for these, that's the thickness of the mucosa was a predictor of early bone loss. So by placing the implant subcrestally, they were able to avoid some of the early implant uh, thread exposure. So what this means is that if the mucosal thickness is too thin, 
you can place the implant a little deeper, and that's one way of basically thickening the mucosa uh, naturally. So we can see that the position of the implant can dictate the tissue healing. If you place the implant toward the facial, you're going to have recession in that area. And also, it will dictate the prosthetics. You're going to have an acute angle of the emergence profile. If you place the implant according to the incisal edge position, then you're basically limited to basically cement retained restoration, but the tissue is going to be actually better preserved, and you will have a pretty good uh, emergence profile. If you prefer uh, screw retained restoration, you head for the cingulum in the orientation, but that will increase the angulation of the emergence profile. But if you place the implant more toward the palatal, that's really going to cause more of a ridge lapping. So we have to somehow balance biology, prosthetics, and come up with something that is somewhere in the middle. We either aim for the incisal edge or the cingulum area, and we could have reasonable prosthetics in that way. So just showing you basically a case uh, similar to um, basically what we've been discussing is that we do a digital examination of the patient, the CBCT, we see that the patient has relatively thick bone phenotype, so we're going to go for immediate placement. We step it back two millimeters, one millimeter apical to the facial crest. We can extract the tooth. We have to make sure that we do this in a less traumatic manner. And then we can utilize guided surgery to help us uh, position the implant more precisely within the socket. And in terms of the depth of placement, we're placing those implants about three millimeters apical to the mucosal margin. We're also, when we're looking at the cervical contour, we're placing the implants about two millimeters palatal to that. And that's going to give us the good prosthetic and uh, also biological positioning of the implants to give us the outcome that we're looking for. So, but we don't always have this intact walls. Because as I showed you, when you have intact walls, you have about 70% of loss on the facial crest. But if you have dehiscence, you have even more resorption during the healing. So having a dehiscence is an extra risk factor. So studies have demonstrated that if you have facial dehiscence and if you attempt immediate placement, you have er more early failures, you have fewer bone uh, healing and more resorption and more recession. So typically when we have facial dehiscence, my personal preference is to go for delayed placement. So we can do delayed placement using our typical biomaterials that we have. Or here, we have some new devices that we can uh, use, socket cap and cage. Socket cap is for sealing the socket, and socket cage is for uh, uh, basically supporting that facial uh, tissue in cases where we have a dehiscence. So I'll show you example of a case that's treated for, you see that facial dehiscence? This lady is 80 years old. We're extracting a tooth. You see that the facial plate is completely resorbed. I personally prefer not to do immediate implant in these cases. We go for delayed placement. After degranulation of the socket very carefully, we'll go ahead and try to uh, stabilize the socket cap. We're using some sutures that are first loosely placed to just position the cap to be ready to go with closure of the socket. And then we can go ahead and position the socket cage, which is a resorbable device. And you'll see this cage will go in very easily. And the spring-like feature kind of holds it in position and will prevent the tissue from collapsing into space. And then we can place biomaterials in the socket and try to, to uh, support that with the cage device. And then once the material is inside, we can go ahead and close the uh, opening of the socket very quickly with that device that looks very simple to uh, use. And then we look at the healing. You can see that after six months, the site is very well preserved. We have that prominence that we had in that area before. 
and after the implant restoration. So we've published several papers looking at various aspects of this, clinical and, and animal studies, looking histologically for very well preservation of the ridge using this particular protocol. And then when we look at whether or not if you're doing immediate placement, should we still place a graft in the socket? The best uh, evidence that we have so far is from the group of Mariano Sanz uh, clinical trial where they had both grafted and non-grafted. And what they found is that especially in sites that had thin bone phenotype, less than one millimeter facial bone, the difference between grafted and non-grafted was very significant. So the non-grafted site resorbed about 2.65 millimeters versus the grafted site had better preservation of the bone. Another study that I've done with my good friend Lyndon Cooper, we did a clinical trial when he was in North Carolina, placing implants with or without grafting. We can see one of the patients from the study from the control group where no grafting was placed, immediate placement, you could see quite a bit of remodeling of the bone on the facial side, but the tissue is still very stable. And the grafted socket, after one year, you could see also the tissue is very stable. So one of our uh, former residents, Ramon Ceballos, uh, he did this, uh, 3D imaging analysis to look for changes in the tissue in these cases and found that the, there was really no significant difference in the tissue mid-facial zenith position in cases that were grafted or not grafted. So although grafting the socket may help with the bone, with the position of the mid-facial zenith, it doesn't seem to help, and it doesn't also seem to help with the papilla position. So grafting may be good for the bone, but it doesn't seem to make a difference for the superficial tissues. But so again, one of the main drawbacks of immediate placement has been the recession. So interproximal recession seems to be more due to what we do during surgery, which is doing a flap. Doing a flap seems to cause you to lose papilla. So the, in terms of the cases that end up with advanced recession, this is again a study by Hugo de Bruins group looking at frequency of advanced recession interproximally. The mean of interproximal recession in most of the studies are less than a millimeter. We could live with that, but Advanced recession, the recession interproximally of more than a millimeter could be found between zero to 27% of cases. So then we have to find out what are those people doing who are getting 0% versus those who are doing 27%. Perhaps there are differences in the protocol. With mid-facial, the same thing. There's increased risk if we're doing flap surgery, but also we talked about the position of the implant. And with advanced recession, and the mid fascia could be seen in zero to 64% of cases. Again, we have to find out what are those people doing who are getting less mid facial recession. So we have to learn from these. One of the things that seems to make a difference is performing soft tissue grafting at the time of implant placement. One of these studies showed that mid facial recession in cases that had no graft had about half a millimeter recession versus those that had a connective tissue graft done simultaneously with the immediate placement had significantly less recession. So perhaps we could incorporate soft tissue grafting at the time of implant placement to minimize that. So let's just kind of put it together in a case just to show you how we would manage a case like this. Patient who is going to lose a central incisor. So what would we do? This patient, we're going to basically do a very careful extraction to minimize trauma. And then once we have that, we try not to do a flap, but we need access. So instead of doing a full flap, we can do a vestibular incision and then do a subperiosteal tunneling. This is called VISTA. So with VISTA, and uh, Alfonso Hill will be talking about that tomorrow in his session more. So with VISTA, it gives us the access that we need by making a vestibular incision. 
but also we are not reflecting the papillae or marginal tissues. So it gives us good access or for good positioning of the implant relative, relative to the facial plate. We can also place the xenograft in that socket. And then at the same time, we could do our connective tissue grafting. I prefer to use the tuberosity for that. And it's very quick when we have the vestibular access. Then we have basically not reflected the papilla or the midfacial tissues, place the implant, immediate provisionalization, and then the healing looks like this. And then we have stability of the tissue, both in the horizontal and vertical dire direction, for this case, over the seven year follow up that we've had. So we look at, at the three years, we had to take a CBCT for another reason. And you could see very nice preservation of the bone because the graf uh, we grafted the socket. But also, when we look at the tissue contour, we, pre we preserve that. So some uh, colleagues prefer to do contour grafting with bone augmentation at the time of immediate placement. I personally think that tissue grafting is a more predictable form of contour augmentation in these cases. So you can see the also the cr uh, crestal bone stability over that. But still doesn't take away from this, that we still are presented with cases that look like this, unfortunate. These cases are there. Who can we blame? Do we say that this is the problem with the implant? Do we say that this is a problem with the concept of implant therapy in the anterior area? Or do we say maybe this, per this particular clinician did not have the understanding of the biology, the prosthetic, and surgical positioning of the implant? So it's both biological and technical. So we have to live with it. So what are we going to do? We can't really take these implants out because these are those expandable type of implants. So we try to treat it without doing, removing those implants, so we have to still try to correct it. So what we did in this case was to remove the superstructure, let the tissues heal initially just to kind of grow into that area, and then we performed the VISTA technique, vestibular incision, subperiosteal tunneling, and you could see that there's still bone on that implant. But the problem is that the implant is too far facially placed. So you can actually see the entire uh, peri-implant bone is still intact, but this particular clinician didn't have the understanding. That's the problem with immediate implant placement. Technically, it's very challenging. Even if dentists know that you should place it to the palatal, Technically, it ends up on the facial because it's hard to control the implant position. So it really is not a technique for someone who doesn't have the experience with this. This is a more advanced technique. So I prefer tuberosity as a donor tissue because it's very stable. So we harvest the tuberosity in this case. We insert it inside of that vista tunnel, vestibular tunnel, position it near the crest of the tissue to give us the bulk that we need, and tuberosity gives us a nice bulk. And this is something that we could do, we should have been done at the time of immediate placement, well, but the, there's other problems with the positioning of the implant, but that's, you could see that we tried to correct it for her and without taking those implants out. So, there are many things, other aspects that we don't have time to cover, but I'll just touch on it. Maybe the macro geometry of the implant, could that be a factor? Perhaps there's a lot of evidence for platform switching, showing that maybe platform switch implants have a little bit less remodeling of the bone. There's also the micro and nano treatment of the surface of the implant, such as laser microtexturing, that seems to help to minimize the remodeling of the bone. There's also uh, application of the uh, LPRF, the platelet-rich fibrin, that seems to mitigate some of, the, uh, uh, some of the remodeling of the bone and accelerate the healing. And then finally, uh, something that my, the next speaker knows a thing or two about with socket shield. Uh, there we are waiting for more data from 
a Marcus's group to see whether that's something that we could adapt into our routine uh, clinical work. So just to summarize, we touched upon the most important areas of risk in this area that has to do with the thin phenotype of the bone. Those patients who have a thin bone that is a millimeter or less, those are at risk. So if you have the clinical expertise to, and feel comfortable to understand the, both the biological and technical aspect, immediate implant placement, I think, is still a very predictable procedure. But if they have a thin bone phenotype, I think we must do the grafting of the socket. That's very well uh, supported. But if you're not comfortable with that, then we can go for delayed placement. That certainly simplifies the technical aspect. But again, if you're doing delayed placement, we should be grafting the socket still. The thin mucosa is still also a risk factor, and that's something that we need to assess as well as the bone. And in those cases, soft tissue augmentation, it, whether we're doing uh, immediate placement or not, may be part of our routine uh, protocol in the anterior aesthetic area. I showed you Vista as a way to do this without doing a full flap in this area. So I still believe that soft tissue augmentation is better than bone contour augmentation, in my personal biased opinion. 3D implant positioning is very important, especially in those cases with thin bone and thin tissue phenotype, because if you're getting the implant positions wrong, if you have a thin tissue phenotype, there's going to be more recession cases. And facial dehiscence is a problem. I know some colleagues here who do immediate implant placement in cases with dehiscence. Personally, I prefer to do delayed placement in those cases, but preserve the site, maybe augment the sites, and then go for delayed placement. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Homa. You're not done yet, so maybe, maybe ask you to sit down over Switch there. Okay. I think this was a very clear summary, and we've seen all the cell phones going Ooh. up. Please don't forget to send us your questions on the iPad so we can collect them for the discussion. But this is not all. So, Isa, we now see that immediate implant placement may not be such an option for this patient, that maybe some other procedures should be preferred. So how, and if we go back to our presentation, please, yep. how would you now continue with this case? What happens? So, Homa, I, I just want... And can you please speak a little bit down? Ladies okay. and gentlemen, please. Okay, so Homa, I, do you remember I presented you? Oh, he's safe. I presented you this uh, lovely 29-year-old uh, lady, and let's always pretend that this is our daughter, our wife, or someone very close to us, and we can see that the situation is quite critical. Now, unfortunately, that was a CT scan that she gave me, and then she went to a dentist who maybe because, and I like the, your last message, maybe because he was under pressure or maybe because he had listened to a fantastic immediate implant placement lecture, he decided to perform an immediate implant on a case, as we've seen earlier on. And guess what? Three months later, everything failed. So she presented to my attention in this state, and I would like to remind you she was 29 years old, and she was, frankly, very upset. And a few months later, she had her big day. So, in fact, I'm not going to reveal we have time to do this, but this is the soft tissue dehiscence after the failure of the immediate implant plus, apparently, a GBR procedure which was not described because I'm reporting what the patient told us, and you can immediately see that there's been quite a lot going on. So, the only thing that we did was nothing, was wait for Mother Nature, which is always our biggest hand, and let the tissues heal spontaneously, because the only thing we have to do at this stage is bring her and provisionalize her for her big day. So you see how pretty and how wonderful she was, and at least she was smiling on that big day. And then we will come back and we will see. Because she didn't receive the final restoration at this point yet. Exactly. Right? So she's completely in working progress. But do you think Marcus would have treated her differently? 
Well, there is this soccer shield thing that we need to hear mm. about, but let's see, you know. Let's I have, have I have a feeling <laughs> he's running away. We will not talk about the soccer shield thing, it's okay. Mm. We have to discuss the cage later on, however. Um, I'd like to address another case. It's a lady in her 50s, so it's a different situation. She's not about to get married, but she's about to lose the tooth number 11, so the central incisor on the right-hand side. It's a traumatic uh, experience that she had as a child, then an endo treatment, and then numerous endo retreatments. Her main wish is to have a fixed replacement. Her second main wish is to have an aesthetic, highly aesthetic replacement of this tooth because also of her high smile line. So this is the situation in a close-up, and now you can al also observe possibly the two fistula. So it was really a situation that was completely inflamed, and if you look at the radiograph, you can also see that she maybe waited a little bit too long with uh, wanting to keep the tooth, because if we look at this situation now, we can see that she had lost a lot of the periodontal support of the adjacent healthy teeth with a little, little peninsula uh, in between the two central incisors, but sort of a go-through defect underneath. So she's about to lose this incisor now. She has a high smile line. She's not in her 20s. But she is Doesn't very happen. demanding and <laughs> kind of complicated. And as many complicated female patients do, they go to Marcus Hürzler's practice. And they ask him, how can we solve this aesthetically? So Marcus, we would love to hear you. Yeah. Enlighten us. Yes, with, with your, your colorful concepts. shoes and your... <laughs> Thank you, ladies. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am too fat. Too oh my, you're not you. done yet. <laughs> <laughs> you will <will> win. <laughs> thank okay. you. So thank you very much. For but before you start, are they printed or not? Are they? Printed. Printed special for you, my So lady. we've got colorful <laughs> and golden. Is the so <laughs> thank you very much, Lee. <laughs> Go for it. For this beautiful introduction. And thank you for inviting me to share with you a little bit our ideas about this hot topic. And yes, so we have to go back here to the start. Okay, you can, okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Oma. At least we know now implants in the aesthetic zone are very complicated. That's clear. All these numbers you showed us, incredibly, your knowledge incredibly. Maybe we have to go back to the roots. Maybe this is too complicated what they showed us. So let me share with you a little bit first my personal thinking about what's going on. And one thing we haven't discussed yet at all, and we need to discuss this, is a problem which you underestimate and which is coming up in the future more and more. And I will share this with you and then I will share the alternatives. And when I started this lecture, I had about five alternatives. Today, I will present you nine. So I found more and more possibilities, which we lost. We don't think about that anymore. And they are so great. So let me share with you all these ideas, which actually are already there since a long time. We just have lost them because implants are so easy which we know today clearly from Oma, it seems not to be so easy. Let's go together on the track. I started about myself 25 years ago, my way to the target, namely placing implant in the aesthetic zone, coming out with a great result, predictably, and maintain it over the next 25 years. This is what we started, or I personally, 25 years ago. And, you know, looking at cases, so the case we treated in 21 years ago, and looking at the case today, 21 years later, great, immediate implant placement, no problem, we can see that, that's what we show all the time. So let's go and do it. Is this the reality? So here you get the feeling on my track through the Minoan labyrinth, I'm almost there. I'm almost at the target. It's not far away. Is this really clinical reality? 
It's clear. We see a lot of cases like this in our office. And I have no doubt that Oma is completely right here. It's not that we can say the implant is bad. Here, something went wrong. But to solve a problem like this and bring it back to a situation like this is a nightmare for the patient. That's a nightmare. Even though she can now marry, she married also after that. Actually, two months after we finalized, she went to the, her marriage. A case like this, it's even better place. It's still not enough, as we know now from Oma. It's a recession, and a recession on the implant is so difficult to get over it and to treat this. It's a nightmare for both, for you, for the patient. So we have this problem, honestly, on a daily basis. It seems not so easy, like it's sometimes presented. Easy, because you go in the palatal soft tissue, and then it's fine. I'm not so sure if it's really all the time so fine. And, you know, here, I get a drawback. Here is something, what I share with you now, which I don't have an answer person. No answer. And this is a so-called facial adaptation. Or you can call it grow, or whatever you want to call it, doesn't matter. This lady got an implant way too early. Look at this now. That's a disaster for this lady. She smiles for me, because I make a little bit jumping around, that she smiles for this picture, but she is not in a mood to smile. Or this lady. Do we have an answer for that? There's so many rumors an answer. I'm more than happy. This would be really, really something I'm very interested in. Now you say, oh, this happens so seldom. That's not true. That's absolutely not true. Already in 1968, Björk came out with this beautiful, beautiful study. He placed it, titanium pins, in the, in the bone, and he followed those patients over the years, and he could clearly show there's an ongoing process in the development of the upper and lower bone. And the group around uh, Björk, uh, excuse me, the group around a friend of mine too, Bernie Zolo, they followed the same patient group over 30, 40 years, when they were already 30 years old to 40 year old. And what did they find? The same thing. It's going on. My dear friend, this is a real problem. And you may say, I have never seen it. It's so seldom. No, it is not seldom. It's more often than you think. Newer studies coming out clearly showing us that this is an ongoing problem which we have at the moment. In my opinion, no answer. And this is the newer study just came out this year from Cochetto, and he came out with the conclusion. Inconclusion was present in 73%. 73%. He didn't look only at the anterior, also posterior. And all of you, I'm pretty sure, who has a lot of experience with implant, has experienced this problem, 100%. Just let's be honest to the truth, what's going on on a clinical daily basis, and not laying back and say, we solved all the problem. And when I look at this data, I mean, and a lady comes in like this, having exactly this problem, what does this mean for this patient? To bring this patient from here to here, it's more than a mind and another three surgeries. Taking out the implants, reconstruct the bone, do soft tissue, and all these things you all know so well. This is really something we have to talk, and it's time to talk about this problem now. It's really time. It's not anymore, oh, I haven't seen it anymore. In my, in my practice, I don't see that. That's not the truth. So looking on my way, you know, all of a sudden, I'm far away. I'm far away of my target, all of a sudden, I'm not any more close to the target that I have solved the problem with implant the aesthetic zone. I'm far away. Now I go to alternatives. I'm looking for alternatives. That's the major discussion I have with my partner. 
what can we do instead of placing implants in the aesthetic zone? This is our major driving force today. And looking what we found, amazing. There are so many things you can do. You have to think about and you should take in your daily treatment planning. Let's go through this. Let's start with the palatal implant. The palatal implant was a development in the orthopedic discipline. Orthodontics, they use palatal implant, you know, to bring teeth, whatever they can do, they place those tooth inside the bone and then you can place an implant on it. This is a big cantilever. Why not use this implant to create a cantilever and place a pontic in this delicate area? This is a wonderful treatment. This lady is 15 years old, she cannot have an implant. So you do a little bit of soft tissue augmentation, creating soft tissue, a pontic site, and create the perfect pontic there. And you know what? This is very predictable and simple and easy. You don't see that she has an implant on the palatal side. And I can tell you, we, did, we do this now since five, six years already. And I can tell you something, because we say, this is now, you're 15, 14, you know, the ladies become delicate, we're 14, 15, they want to be nice when they smile at us. Huh? They, and so, they don't want to have removal of resin bond, but they always fall out. He doesn't like that, what I just said, but it happens on a daily basis. But that's what, it's easy to manage. And I can tell you something, the experience you have with these ladies, when they're 21, 22, what do they tell? Do I need an implant? I have no problem. This is fine, it looks beautiful. I don't, it's, everything is perfect. That's the experience we have. So think about that. Look at this. This is four years later. Would you see, when I show you this picture, this is an implant on the palatal side. They accept this incredibly. And they are happy. There are alternatives. There are more alternatives. Indeed, resin bonded bridge. This is a good option, no doubt. The long-term data are much better today with resin bonded bridges, as we all know. And so we have to think about this alternative. It's a great alternative, specifically for the lateral incisor. Maybe with the central incisor, we have even more problems. But the lateral one, we would always think about this option, do again a little bit of pontic site development, create nice pontic site that you can create perfect resin bonded bridge, single width, as it's classical today, as Matthias Kern clearly shown us, and it's a wonderful treatment. I mean, I would love this. This looks perfect. This looks like a natural tooth. And surgical extrusion, we have lost this. This treatment, we think this is completely new. This is not new. This was published first already in 78. When you have not enough feral effect, just extrude the tooth surgically a little bit, and then you have enough ferrule, then you prepare the tooth, and you don't know how fast this is. It's a one to two week, you stabilize the tooth for one, two weeks, then you take off the splint, you wait another two, three months, and then you do the final preparation, make a crown. I mean, what is wrong with that? This is perfect. Maybe you get some resorption. That's true. This is a study over the most teeth published, 58 teeth. And yes, you get resorption. That's true. You will see resorption. Two teeth had to be taken out in this study. The other teeth, they had, 17 had some resorption, but the patient had no problem. So I leave it in there. They left it in, not a problem. So a case where we had exactly this problem. So we do root canal treatment, we extrude the tooth, we stabilize the tooth for two weeks, one to two weeks, depending on the extraction socket. Then we wait two months. Then we prepare the teeth, we have enough feral effect now, and we can make a nice crown on it. Simple, easy, a forgotten treatment. This was 2016. Here we had a little bit of resorption, three years later. Yes, so what? There's no infection there, I can leave it. If the patient is concerned, then we can still do an implant. But at the moment, no problem. Orthodontic solution. If you don't want to do it surgically, do it orthodontically. And orthodontically is always an option. Here we had a fracture on the level of the bone. So yes, you can extract the tooth. 
We do this. Most of us extract teeth in a moment like this, 100%, because we think implants are so easy. Do you want it in your mouth? I have a lot of dentists coming to us. You know, the dentist itself, himself is the major really reason when you are going to do the right decision in your treatment plan. I can tell you that. And many dentists today, they come and say, young guys, oh, I have a fracture. I need to take out the tooth. What is the best option? They don't say, can you place me an implant? They think about other things. Is this an option? We extrude the tooth after root canal treatment. We use again anchor. Always use anchor on the palatal side. This is beautiful. There is no reaction on the neighboring teeth. You bring the tooth out. You prepare the tooth. And you see how much we extruded the tooth. And then you make the final crown. And you maintain all what is necessary. It's really simple. It's going back to the roots. And they have what they want. They have still their root in there. And what are we? We all here in the room are dentists. And we have one thing. We should have one thing in our mind. And this is only one thing. We become dentists to maintain teeth and not to extract teeth and place a shoe in there. That's our main task, our main target. And those happy patients, orthodontics, you can make orthodontic space, clo uh, space closing. Very simple. She's missing teeth, so let the orthodontic just close it, bring the canine in lateral position. Maybe you place an implant posterior, like here. There is some space for an implant in the premolar area. No problem. You can always solve this problem, but the aesthetic zone. Let the facial adaptation going on the next 30 years. No problem. Wonderful option. I would always go with this option. If my child has a problem, this would be a big option for me. Next thing, sophisticated endo. Now we are so much evidence-based. Everybody speaks about evidence-based. We have to do everything according to the evidence. If you look at this case, we did everything against the evidence. But there is also an internal evidence. There is also some knowledge you have, which tells you, maybe when I do that, this works great. This lady comes to us for implant. She was referred to us from far, far away in Europe, and she only wants implant. It took us two hours to convince her that she do not take implants. Costs a lot for us, but it doesn't matter, because this lady, if this is my mother, I would 100% offer her this treatment, what we did. Look at this endotherm. There are perforation, there are, I mean, apical lesion, there's everything in there. You can say, okay, now you do Redo the root canal treatment. Now I know exactly. Somebody here in the front, who is a big guy knowing evidence about root canal treatment, how predictable is this, comes up and says, this, this is a disaster. This post can break next week. That's true. I can say no. He's right. I have no, I cannot say this will work 100%. But I can tell you, if it's one tooth, no problem. Then I still can solve the problem. I have still options. This lady, 2004, you see, 2004, our endo gate did the endo treatment. We did four crowns, simple, easy, some crown preparations of good lab technician like you have, and then make nice crowns on it. This is, uh, this is a job of them, not of us. And so we have beautiful teeth, 2004. Now, look what's happened. This lady, 2019. This year she comes in. Oh, pff, oh everything is in there. Oh, look at the radiograph. Look at the radiograph. Oh, my goodness. Everything is in. No break. Nothing is broken. It's according to the evidence. You can kill me, I know. You can shoot me away from the stage. I know that. But is this everything? No. It's you with your experience, your knowledge. And you would say in a situation like this, let's keep this deal. Let's try it. That's what I would do personally. 100%. I have still every option to go now. Is this not beautiful? Look at the smile. Everybody in this room, I guarantee, with two or three or whatever, even you, my friend. If you get this smile, forget it. Never, never. You don't get the smile like this. This is impossible. But Mother Nature is doing the job for us. Keep the teeth, that's it. Autotransplantation. We lost, we lost autotransplantation. Yes, you can have failures with autotransplantation. But this treatment has changed today. 
Today, it's a wonderful treatment. You can do DICOM data, you transfer them in SEL data, then you print your tooth, which is somewhere in there, you know, and then you go and take it out, and then the first thing before you take out the tooth in the mouth, you do the dry in with a dummy. This is the major problem. The major problem is when you take the tooth out and then you start boom, 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 out the din, and the periodontium, uh, the periodontium is, you know exactly what I mean. Then the periodontium is damaged, and then you get more resorption. So we have to do all the study. From Andreas and all these great studies, we have to do again. And I'm 100% convinced, if we follow these new guidelines, we are going to be great, much better than what we have done in the past. But first, we have to do those studies. But it's an option we should still have in our mind. And if it's a young lady, I mean, when you can take a tooth out which has not a final root tip, there is a very high chance that it works great. You all know that. Also, these studies are here. Here's a case. We know the studies. They are good studies, but better study can be done now with the new technology, knowing this new digital world. It's absolutely marvelous. I like this. And so, here a case. Look at this, what we see here. He has a fractured tooth. The tooth is fractured under the bone. And up there is a mesiodent. You see that. So why not taking out the mesiodent, placing in the extraction socket, let it heal? Not a big deal, believe me. Surgically, much more easy than what he showed you. Much more easy. You just take the tooth out up there, up there and then you place it there. This is not such a demanding surgery for everybody here in the room. You are also a great surgeon. Everybody of you is a great surgeon here. So open the flat, take out the leftover what is in there, and then go and take out the small tooth up there. You have a dummy, you try in the dummy into the nose. Here we go into the nose. We have to take it out in the nose that we don't take too much bone away, that we don't damage the periodontium. And then we place it in there. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. And we stabilize it depending on the extraction socket size, how long you have to stabilize it. That's a decision you have to make as a surgeon. Depending on the gap is between your tooth and the bone wall. And then it heals in, you wait, and then you prepare this tooth. Now, I know in the past, we always said the conto is a big problem. But we have the, Ameri we have the, the Italian guy, Ignazio Loy, who said, we can go a little chamfer preparation, which you cannot say this word in Zurich. But we know we can do that. We can do a chamfer preparation. And then, uh, excuse me, a feather edge preparation, a feather edge preparation. And then you can create, like what we do on implants, what do we do on implants? We do exactly the same thing. We create the soft tissue in the aesthetic zone with the contour. We can do the same thing on the tooth. Why not? And here you see the teeth, tooth. You wait here two and a half months, prepare the tooth with a feather edge. Endo treatment needs to be done. This is clear. And now you see what you can do. You just place a crown on it. I mean, wonderful. Look at the contour there. You have to look at You are the contour man. There. The prostor guy. You look at this, 2016, and look, I mean, looks like a tooth, a wonderful tooth. And now, three years later, it looks the same. A great alternative. Easy. And everybody can do that. We just have to go back to the roots. That's it. External, this is also something, external cervical root resorption. When we have that, it's clear, external root resorption extraction. It is clear. We need to take the tooth out, and we need to take an implant. It's always the same thing. Everybody says that. OK, let's look at this. We have already some literature about it. Not so good literature. I have to admit that. This is just some observation in this yet. But still, it's an observation. We come back to the external evidence. The evidence is low. I agree. We have very low evidence about this kind of treatment. There are not many studies, not many long-term studies, but we need if we do something. But do you lose something? Do you lose something if you have an external cervical lesion and you manage this with composite and place the flap back? Do you lose something? Nothing. Not at all. This is perfect. Here, this lady on this cannon. Yeah, you can take out the tooth, you can place an implant, and then you... You do everything what he, what Omar told us, a lot of work, maybe two or three surgery. Here, you open it a little bit, 
you manage the external resorption, you take it out during the surgery, you fill it up with composite, then you add a little bit, whatever you want, I mean, you can cover it with soft tissue. I mean, it's now a little bit delicate if you want to do that. The question is if you have to do that. But she wanted to have a little bit of coverage of the recession at the same time. So we moved the tissue coronally and we stabilized the tissue there. And this is the situation 2015. So let's look at the situation 2019. Nothing has changed, not at all. Everything is great. If you really carefully clean out the resorption, you take all the tissue out there. This is absolutely with the loops. When you have loops on the light, everybody in the room can do that. Everybody. I'm 100% convinced. This is not such a difficult task. This is carriers, the K removal of carriers. Everybody has learned this already in the under, under, undergraduate level, so everybody can do that. And then fill it up with a composite buckley. I mean, it's not an interproximal contact point, which make my, I, I cannot do that. So, but this you can do, simple and easy, polish it, and then place the flap back. Maybe you do some delicate plastic surgical procedure at the same time. But this is a perfect treatment. I lose nothing. Forget evidence. It's here, not the issue. It's the patient. The patient in the center of your thinking. What would you do? Paid on the treatment, that's my favorite. Paid on the treatment, my absolute favorite. Because, you know, we learn today to take a tooth out and to burr a bow, a hole in the bone, to place a screw like a carpenter. That's what we learn. We have forgotten completely periodontal treatment. We have forgotten that periodontal treatment has done in the last 10 years a huge step. I'm going to show you this now. I guarantee you will be surprised what's going to happen now. Again, this is something you can learn. This is something you need to learn. But if you want to have the biological understanding to be a great surgeon, you need to understand the periodontium, the biology behind you when you do a surgery. I always say to my participants in our courses, I want to make out of you a biological thinking surgeon. This is my favorite task. That's the only thing I want. I don't want mechanical to 1.5 millimeter there. No, I want you to understand what you're doing when you open a flap. What tissue you touch, you touch, what tissue you are not allowed to touch. There's a lot of misunderstanding still today because at the university, it's not taught anymore. It's more taught taking out, placing through. <laughs> Easy. This is what we have to learn again. Now I'm going to show you, this for me is one of the landmark studies in the last 15, 20 years, or 50 or 10 years, let's say like this, in our field of dentistry. This study is a randomized clinical trial, and they compared maintaining a tooth which is hopeless, which has attachment loss around the apex, with placing an implant, 25 teeth, Maintaining 25 teeth extraction, placing an implant. They published, Godellini and Sandro published the five years data, and now they are on the way to publish the 10 years data. And he gave me some data. I called him because I know I'm a big fan of this study. This is a landmark. This must make us think what we are going to do. This must make us think. And they came up, you see here, that's the new data after 10 years. On the implant side, they had three dropouts because the patient, so they have 21, page, 21 implants to follow. On the two side, they lost two teeth after one year and one tooth after eight years. And they have now, and two dropouts, they have 20 teeth to follow. Amazing, amazing. When we look at the 10 years, look at this. Hopeless tooth at the beginning, after 10 years, 20 teeth, Teeth are still in the mouth. They were quoted at the beginning as hopeless, completely hopeless. And they are still in the mouth after 10 years. Probing them around these teeth after 10 years, 3.6 millimeters. Attachment level, no changes. It's amazing. 
10 years data. We don't speak now about one or two years. We don't speak about six, seven years. We speak about 10 years. Who is going to do that? Look at this, 2008. This case, I showed on a big implant meeting and discussed this with Uli Grunder, Sasha Ivanovic, and Fuad Kuri. What are you going to do? We discussed the central and the lateral incisor. When you are losing the central and lateral incisor, what are you doing? And you know, everybody has his own recipe to reconstruct the bone. Somebody takes a tortoise bone, the other takes a membrane like you, and the other one, whatever, you know. <laughs> then they restore the soft tissue, and you know what was the difference in treatment concept? I tell you, the currency at the end of the amount, what they had to pay, 25,000 US dollar, 25,000 euro, or 25,000 Swiss franc. But the rest was everything the same. For surgery, this lady cannot afford that. She doesn't have the money. So what did we do? Yes, hopeless teeth. The tooth falls out when you open the flap, and you don't splint it, I know that. But we treat this with new flap design, new way of thinking. Yes, the microsurgical concept we teach now since more than 20 years is not just using a microscope, my dear friend, microscope, my dear friend. This is more. This is much more. This is a philosophy. Understanding what you're doing here. Understanding your flap design. Understanding how you deal with the tissue on the surface and so on. And we treated that. I don't want to go into detail and the special flap design and microsurgical suturing. Now, this is not interesting for you. 2009. At the end of the treatment, we do some composite there to close the embrasure area a little bit. And then we wait. This is 2019. 11 years later, this is the situation radiographically. 11 years later, clinical situation. How many of you would have been better with taking out these two T and bone augmentation, whatever? I asked this question to all these specialists, and what did they say? I don't think so. This is what we have to think about. Two, three millimeter probing them. A happy patient. This must be our goal, my friend. So you see, this is incredible option available when you think about what to do instead of placing an implant. So my conclusion remarks, if this is a very important person in your life, namely, this is my daughter, this is my daughter Svenja, some of you know her, and you find out with 21, 22 years old, she has a problem on the canine. She has an external cervical resorption. So what are you going to do? You see this on the radiograph. You're going to extract this tooth to place an implant? You're going to do that? I? Never. I would never do that to you. This is my most important person in my life, my dear friend. And this is how you should treat your patient. You should think the patient is on the chair, is your most important person. This is the way you can only, that's the only way to make treatment planning. The only way. Otherwise, you do bias sick, you are better in implants, so you tell the patient it's the best treatment. Honestly, this is always the way. If you like to do resin bonded bridges, you're going to tell the patient this is the best treatment. That's what he's doing. Because he likes it and he's so much biased. This is the best treatment. No, you have to do the treatment which you would do to your most important person. That's what I did. We open the flap, we take out the resolve, we fill it up, and we place the flap back. And this is 2019. My daughter is still happy with the canine, my dear friend. So when I look at this, and going back to our my start slide, on the way to the target, where I am on the way to the target, I think I start again. Thank you very much. You have, so. a, you, you have a very pretty daughter. Sorry? You have a very pretty daughter. Yes. A very pretty, pretty daughter. daughter. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so this was explosive. I need to bring something. <laughs> <laughs> this was explosive. You need to be a little bit more an animated. Yes. You're, you're very right. subdued today. <laughs> <laughs> ah, it was fun. It was fun. Okay. It was fun. Thank you. It was great. OK. <laughs>
So now comes the interesting part. Yeah, now we're going to question you a little bit. We have received uh, quite a lot of questions from the audience. Thank you very much. So we're going to address some of the questions, and then we're going to bit brainstorm on, uh, on the famous uh, wedding girl yes. and uh, the other lady. Well, Homa, um, one of the questions is concerning this cap and um, specific method that you showed. The question is, how do you do your provisionals when you use the cap? Well, the same as you would do for any ridge preservation procedure. So typically, I would prefer a tooth-borne type of a provisional. If you have, can have a Maryland bridge or, or an Essex appliance, something that's not tissue supported would be ideal. But can you elaborate a little bit more on this cap and the cage? What is it about? What material is it? Is it resolvable? It reminds me a little bit of your socket shield, but it's obviously something Artificial. that's Artificial. Right. Yeah. So the, the cap is polypropylene, it's a non-resorbable, so it's intended to be removed within three to four weeks, the same as well, what you would use with a non-resorbable membrane. The only thing is that rather than going under the tissue, it actually sits right on top of the tissue uh, to allow a little bit more augmentation in there. And the cage is resorbable. Uh, I can tell you, but, well, it's been published, uh, the, the, the version that was in publication is a polylactide, but we have now a copolymer, which is a little bit uh, better in terms of its stability, but it resorbs within six months. Okay, and how long is your experience with this method? Well, we have been using that for since 2011 in some of our clinical trials and animal studies. And right now, we're in the final stages of going through the regulatory approval and so on. So hopefully, uh, they will be on the market at some time. Ah, so soon. it's not on the market yet. Not That's yet. important information. That's right. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. those are from I see from everybody the looking for it. <laughs> those are uh, in the study phases right now. Yeah. Okay. Oh, OK. Thank you. And we have a question asking, um, do you remember the case you showed about the, the central and the lateral where the central was completely buccally exposed yeah. and you treated it with, with a soft tissue augmentation. And the question is referring exactly to that case saying, but what if I don't find the bone, buccal bone plate on that implant, even though it's buccally uh, positioned? Would you still consider uh, doing a connective tissue graft there from the tuberosity and how would you treat it? Well, I think uh, soft tissue augmentation around implants. In that case, the implant was actually submerged and put to sleep. One of them, the one that was in better position, was actually restored. So we had a cantilever pontic over the area that was too facially placed. But I find soft tissue augmentation to be more useful in these cases to build the contour, uh, whether the, you're taking the implant out or uh, or leaving a man uh, as a submerged uh, sleeper. But there is one question respe with respect to the soft tissue augmentation volume. How stable is this over time? And don't you think it's much better if you have bone grafts underneath? I personally believe soft tissue depends on the source of it. Uh, tuberosity tissue is very, very stable. I think, if anything, during the initial stages, tuberosity actually seems to expand. So uh, I would say that the volume of tuberosity is highly stable, even when we're using non-resorbable or relatively low resorption type of bone for contour augmentation, there's still some resorption of that that takes place, and we don't have as much of control over the contour. I was going to say, I would like to hear Marcus, because I know you have extensive I think knowledge on this. You know, that's, that's what I would like when we sit here and discuss about and say tuberosity tissue is very stable. How can we say that? I mean, that's your personal experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is very dangerous because they go out and try it and then tuberosity tissue is very dangerous. We have to be careful. If somebody is used to a tucalligraph to depetalize a free gingiva graft, and he does the same thing with a tuberositis graft, he leaves a lot of epithelium there. And then this tuberositis has an incredible tendency to grow. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you have to thin this out a lot. You have to take off at least, that's our, that's again, I say again, that's our experience, but we take always one millimeter away. Right. There's a lot of tissue you have to take away. But the thing is, we cannot stay here on the stage in such a distinguished group and say it's very stable. We have no data. 
And we need to create data. This is now an, a, really an appeal on everybody. We should create data about which graph we should use for which indication. I like that you said you use tuberosis as indication. I use the same thing in this indication. But it's a gut decision we both do. Mm -hmm. And we have to say this. It's a gut decision because we think it's more stable, but we have no data. And this is, needs to be clearly stated here. This is very important. And in fact, it tends to augment over time in some exactly. cases. Exactly. That's another issue which, which, which we try issue. to come against it because we remove at least, we measure this one millimeter of tissue away, always. That's just a recommendation. Of course. This is an internal evidence. This is nothing mm -hmm. scientifically proven. But this is what we do today. Well, the same could go with uh, bone augmentation. In terms of the volume stability, we don't have as much data about that as well. So I, I, I'm absolutely with you. Uh, yeah. the, 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 the question, if you need bone or if you need soft yeah, tissue, yeah. I'm with you. Soft tissue, in our experience, mm -hmm. I, if we all here in the room open our implant in aesthetic yes. zone, honestly, after 10 years, you would see how much bone you have on the buckle side on all those implants, but they still look good because they have nice tissue around it. That's right. And that's, that's the truth. So the tissue may be even more important. I agree with you with that. And can we link this concept of the soft tissue on the root resorption cases that you have shown, for example, once you treat the, the, the external cervical root resorption cases, you would add immediately a, a soft tissue graft. Would you do it in a second stage? And if no, you add it immediately, where the vascularization comes from, do you rely on the... That's something we have shown clearly. I mean, there is evidence from us, from our study, where we did a randomized clinical trial, and we add connective tissue. And it's clearly come out from this study that when you thicken the tissue, you create more stability. This is clear. And we have now five years data there. And we have a volumetric analysis, so we know today clearly Thickening makes sense, you create more stability. This I can say. Which goes hand in hand with the advancement of the periodontal regeneration techniques where the minimally, extra minimally invasive techniques are based on supporting, hmm. in fact, the, the, the defect with the, with the tissues once we used to open larger flaps, whereas now we tend to, to keep everything as minimally invasive to achieve these results. And Marcus, I think you should add that the cases that you've shown, which are phenomenal, especially for the periodontal regeneration, requires a very high technical skill, which... But when you have listened uh, to what Omar said, I mean, doing an implant today in the aesthetic zone... I agree, is, 100%. Is, is, ...is amazing when it comes to the technical thinking, what we have to understand, biological, Biologically. technically, what we have to understand to place an implant in the aesthetic zone. Absolutely. I but mean, you've seen the disaster it's, it's that was the happening. Same thing with that, I agree with you. Let's, let's catch up with your case. Okay, let's Maybe catch up with the case. we can discuss this mm -hmm. case. It's really, can you go back to our computer, please? Because, for example, she was, she was a young lady where the immediate reaction, the immediate reaction was, let's jump in, extract the tooth, and let's do an immediate with something. And then you've seen what happened. <laughs> so this is the, this is the, the, in, the result of a failed implant and GBR. Mm -hmm. So now the tooth is gone. So what do you do? How old is she? 29. 29. And she just got married. <laughs> <laughs> what? And she had just got <laughs> she had she has just got married. So now she's in your hands. Easy. Okay. Palatal implant. Soft tissue augmentation, palatal implant finished. Okay, there is a question with respect to these implants. How do you perform the oral hygiene? Right. And how do you instruct the patients? This is simple. You would, you would be surprised how easy those patients can clean them. It's really, I mean, they have super floss, they clean it up. We have absolutely no problem with the hygienic, with those kind of uh, reconstruction. But uh, let me show you the, well, obviously this is, okay, so this was obviously during the surgery. I wanted to, to show you that, yes, the soft tissue contour, and you say palatal implants to avoid basically this process, to avoid the GBR, because it's too invasive, because you... W tell us why. If you go with GBR, bone regeneration, you are planning an implant. Because yeah. it doesn't make sense, of course. otherwise it doesn't make sense to augment the of bone. Course. So then is your treatment plan is clearly in the direction of placing an implant, then you do GBR. But you also can think about soft tissue augmentation, bridge lab, uh, pontic site development, and then I mean, this is very minimally invasive. Sure. 
And uh, certainly basin, less invasive than this, that's for she sure. Has a, well, uh, I'm not so sure if palatal implants are so minimally invasive. This is a two mini procedure. Okay, but there is another more minimally invasive option that we've discussed. That's your uh, resin bond bridge. Right. You mean, oh, this is a central incisor. They will be careful with a central incisor. And also, comes the function, and right? also okay. she had a diastema originally, so that, that also yeah. requires you know, some thinking process. Homo, how would you treat her? Well, I think it's always a discussion with a patient and patient preference. Many times, patients who've had a surgical failure, they're basically gun shy. They may think twice about going through multiple surgeries again, but this certainly would require a surgical intervention if the patient wants to have an implant. I think that those are two options. I think a one wing Maryland bridge could be a definitely one option if the patient is not interested in uh, surgical intervention, but I think doing GBR and implant with soft tissue augmentation, I think is a viable option for this patient. Hmm. Okay, okay. So what did you do? Well, I went through, what did you say, the membranes? About? <laughs> you were making fun of me earlier, like you used the membranes, you said. <laughs> you told me. You need a membrane. <laughs> there yeah, you go, is. there you here go. Here it is, your membrane, good. <laughs> I love it. I am in love with my membrane. <laughs> <laughs> I love your membrane. Okay, so, so the aim here is to reconstruct, as you were saying, the hard tissues and then the soft tissues, and I agree, it's obviously a process, for example, that requires time. In this case, you have to respect time enormously. There is no need to rush it through. So the, the three-dimensional GBR was, was, was performed, and obviously now we have a ridge where then the implant can be positioned and followed through. So um, we have obviously, the, again, to respect the time, and this is the before and after, then the implant is, is, is planned prosthetically, and so on. And the patient is, is, is ongoing. And now it's the soft tissue, soft tissue phase, and the most important, the provisional conditioning the tissues, and so on. So obviously this is something. Maybe a good question to Homa. Would you perform a soft tissue augmentation in this case, or how would you proceed? Have you, would you have done an immediate implant placement in this, pr in this patient in the first place? I would have not done Im immediate implant in the initial phase. The part that I would agree with Marcus is that if we have any option to save teeth, I would certainly would be up for saving the teeth. So I would view implants for option for no teeth. If they don't have a tooth or if you have a tooth that is not uh, viable, I think I agree with your point with about periodontally hopeless teeth. I would definitely save that but I'm not sure I agree with saving teeth that have endodontically compromised or structural losses. I think those things are really a uh, big risk in the future. But uh, if we were going to do this, I think Isabella did a beautiful job for uh, bone augmentation. Typically, I would do soft tissue augmentation in conjunction with the implant. That way, we're reducing the number of procedures that, that have to be done. Uh, so whether it's done as a flapless procedure with a vista tunneling, vestibular tunneling to add the soft tissue, I think that that way you only have two surgical interventions rather. But than you three. always do the soft tissue augmentation with the anterior cases. Uh, yes, you do, and definitely. You? I think that's part of the before. Problem. Well, with anterior implant cases. No, I think this is the right way. What they yeah. discussed is absolutely. I would do it with the implant placement. I would do the there is a there is a there is a question from the audience in regard to this saying you know when I see such a large bone destruction which is which is not enormous, I think that um, it can lead to worse situation if it fails which we all agree mm -hmm. on because obviously you take a risk and that's why the alternative solutions may it, it they're not easier to 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 get but maybe they give us leeway. Of, of avoiding massive destructions. But I think that in general, whatever we do has obviously a risk, and that's why the learning curve and the humbleness of approaching biologically the patient is mandatory. So this is something that to keep in mind. I would like to see maybe an alternative solution and see what happens, for case. example, the other lady who is in her 40s or 50s. Well, she's in her 50s, she's very critical, and again, this is just to remind you of the situation. I don't know if I have the radiograph, no. So uh, in her case, it's clear the tooth has to come out. So what would you do to replace this tooth? Do you remember the bone level? It was, well, at least reduced by six or seven millimeters vertically at both adjacent healthy neighboring teeth. 
unless you would save High this. smile line. Well, yes. I don't think that you can save this. Not even with your... Look, look, he's, he's, he's frowning. <laughs> yeah, the frowning is good. You can good. do auto. You can help her with auto and space closing, and then you have... It depends. How old is she? Uh, in her 50s. 50? Yeah, she's not, a different. She's not keen on year, auto. Uh, in a 50 year, I didn't would start with space closing orthodontically, this is too, I wouldn't do it. If the patient wanted, yeah, but the, this is too. But again, I mean, I tell you the option. I mean, in 51, you can place an implant, there's no doubt. Do you I remember the bone? Huh? You remember the smile line? The bone reconstruction? I mean, it's always a risk. Of course. And we always have to think about what is your medical status, her medical history. She's a healthy uh, patient. Uh, what She's is not the smoking. I mean, every augmentation procedure is a risk. But you have a vertical bone loss. I know, I know. And you can. So I would, I would rather go with. I, I'm a big fan today, which we see our cases with the palatal implant and the pontic site. This is a, an incredible predictable, and the results are amazing. And the data. I mean, we have only five years of experience yet, but this is a, a great thing and it's minimally invasive. The risk for the surgery is pretty low. So it's, a, it's a, an option we all should think about. So you would go for a palatal implant, Homer. what would you? What would you do? I would go for a delayed implant placement, probably just preserve and augment the socket and uh, place for an implant at a delayed time. But uh, I think maybe in this case, because of the crowding, orthodontics is a good idea if the patient is amenable to that, and then perhaps extruding that tooth uh, with orthodontics while you're doing uh, all the other space optimization. I think that might also be a... a okay, so there was pus coming out of those two fistulas, so keeping the tooth longer than, uh, than this moment was not an option, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So it had to come out. No, this is true. Would you like to see what we've done? Huh? Would you like to see what we've done? Yes, or should we end sure. here? Tell me what you did. Are you interested? <laughs> <laughs> you will change your mind afterwards, I can tell you. Well, this is the situation after tooth removal, very careful tooth oh, removal. Out of transplantation. Well, we had no buckle bone, so where would you transplant the, the, a, the other tooth in? He will extract the other central incisor and put it in. <laughs> 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 and then do an immediate implant placement in the other socket. You put That's the premium in. Place a you have to do that. In the other Excellent. <laughs> You're both not prostodontists, right? <laughs> obviously. So you did. There is an obvious. That's a bony bridge. Well, so we did reach preservation with a large connective tissue graft. Mm, that's in, good. In order, that's yes. not the punch technique, but in order to preserve, not only to preserve, but also to augment the volume. Uh, she was taking antibiotics for 10 days, and this was the healing after 10 days. It was uneventful. Um, healthy patient, no risk factors, maybe we have to say this. Yeah. However, psychologically a little bit difficult. This was the situation after pontic site development with a removable prosthesis. And now, this is the, you can see how much we augmented the pontic site where we started. And this is what we've done. Yeah. And it's a resin-bonded bridge, a single-wing resin-bonded bridge with a zirconia framework, fully veneered. Uh, the uh, neighboring incisor was the abutment tooth. It was cemented 2008. Good. And you can see that we preserved the height of the interdental tissues and also of the buccal tissues on the neighboring teeth. This is the situation 2013, and you can see the radiograph. You can also see the, the collagen material, the xenograft, a little bit integrating. Patient was smiling, very happy. And this is the situation at this uh, five-year recall radiologically. And this is a 10-year re recall. But this is what I said too. I yes. said also soft tissue augmentation, so pontic site development, you do a, you do a resin body bridge, mm -hmm. and I have an implant on the palatal side, this is no different, mm -hmm. this is perfect. But I think this is much less invasive than a palatal implant, isn't oh, the it? The palatal implant is too many things. <laughs> too many things, I don't no, even notice that. But I, I, I agree, this is a good treatment, it's a very good treatment. So, I, I'm a, so we wanted I think we have, uh, exactly, we have it. the expert sitting in <laughs> the front row. He likes it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, in order to wrap it up, we, well, we just wanted to tease you and tweak you on a situation where, unfortunately, the tooth had been extracted, lost, made disaster with, with, a, with a bony atrophy. 
and also an alternative solution when you are starting, as you showed, the tooth is still there and that gives you the freedom to think biologically saying, let's save it first. So I think the message, I no. think it's, uh, it's, 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 pretty it's very clear. clear. Homa, uh, anything to add from your side? Californian comment on that? I think this is an excellent alternative. I think uh, I um, am full agreement. I think this one wing um, resin bonded restorations are very predictable. So we actually use those also in the posterior area for long term. We have many cases of patients who don't want to do sinus augmentation for molar. And We're just submitting 10-year outcomes of these yeah. bridges in the anterior region, and they have a 100% yeah. survival rate. No other option has this after 10 years. OK, so we hope we could convince you at least that there is also other options than implants, right? <laughs> Definitely. Unfortunately, the time is out. We would like to continue. There's a you. lot to be discussed. Thank you very much. Please thank give a hand guys. to the speakers. <laughs> and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Wait, wait, hold on. And welcome live from the EAO Congress in Lisbon. If you're still watching, stay tuned because you have at least 30 minutes of exclusive online content ready for you. Because what's going to happen as Isabella Rochetta closed down the session upstairs, we have a runner next to the stage and they will bring Homa Sade and Marcus Hutzler right here into the studio where I'm still joined by Stefan Fickel, who's a professor at the University of Würzburg and also owns a private office in Nuremberg. And you're an expert on the topic we're discussing here today. Stefan, welcome back. Thanks, Gerrit. Let me, before I get to you, Stefan, make a shout out to some of the uh, participants online. Let me start with Dr. Anjus S. Parihar, who is watching us from India, who, who says he really likes joining in. I should say good evening to our viewers in the Far East, because I also saw we have people from Taiwan, where's Taiwan? Yeah, it's Faker Wen. Good to see you, Faker. I hope Great. you're still with us. And uh, we actually have some first questions. So we're collecting all the questions right now. We'll pitch them to the speakers as they come. But I can also imagine it's been a long session, 90 minutes. Mm. So maybe some of our viewers tuned in later. So um, let's do a quick rerun. Mm. Session was titled, Should We Avoid Implants in the Aesthetic Zone? Stefan, what were your personal key messages that you took away from this session? Well, I think the session was about this dilemma you have as a clinician. Um, if I have a tooth which seems to be hopeless, I mean, this is what we have to say now after seeing the, the session. Should I take it out and place an implant? And w we sometimes as clinicians think this is the only way to go. Yeah. I mean, if a tooth is lost or is hopeless, I mean, already implant comes out in my, our mind. And I think we had both speakers beautifully addressing that topic, showing us uh, Homa's way to go if he goes merely for implants. And I think we already uh, uh, expected that. So um, and he says he goes for a well a single shot approach, immediate approach when everything is intact, probably a trauma case. And he goes for a delayed approach, socket preservation, ridge preservation, if he sees a case with the dehiscence. And he also showed us that uh, additional soft tissue might be helpful, especially if he sees thin parental biotypes. On the other hand, we saw Marcus um, being a little bit the uh, advocatus diaboli, uh, telling us maybe we should not be so stubborn, uh, only seeing this technical aspect, so how to place and when to place and uh, how much tissue. But let's open our vision as clinicians and see that there are many other options. And um, there are definitely options. Um, some of them a little more critical, some of them I think very valid options, and I think we should tackle our, our speakers at least with this, uh, with these options, and asking Homa maybe, are these options for you too, and asking Mark, is the implant out of, uh, outdated now? Yeah, because we, we learned from both speakers that obviously working in the aesthetic zone is, is, high st is a high stake game, right? And, yeah. and Homa showed us several techniques and approaches to, to do this properly. And then Marcus came in and he literally states, this is going to be a problem, a bigger problem than it actually solves in the nowadays. And the key aspect he introduced was the fact that we now come to understand 
that the bones keep growing regardless what age you are. This was one point he made and um, th the other point he made is that we don't really know what's going to happen on the long term. Your example, you asked me if, if you need an, another restoration on your implants tw placed 20 years ago. Maybe a lot of things have changed from the tissue situation, also from the growing aspect. But this was his, his main point is that uh, the, the implant is ankylosed in the bone, meaning it is glued to the bone. And the tooth is, is there just by fibers. So there might be differences, of, not over a year, but over five years, over 10 years, over 15 years. And suddenly you will have an implant infrapositioned in comparison to teeth. And well, he also focused on the patient. I mean, just he said, imagine, I mean, what kind of effort will it be for the patient to re-restore that? And I think this is also what we discussed in the beginning, that we expect this from the session, that um, the, the, the speakers will tackle the re-restoration, because the re-restoration is probably the most difficult thing we have in, in dentistry or in medicine at all. Exactly, yeah. So we had a broad outlook to that. And if you're to, to joining us later, maybe you've just tuned in, rest assured that this session will stay available on the EEO channel here on YouTube. So once we've ended in about 30, 40 minutes maybe, you can go back and watch the whole thing from the start. We have a, another shout out, this time from Indonesia. So it must be getting late at night where you are. Oni Irianto. So uh, thanks, thanks for participating. And this is how it works. If you're watching live, use the chat function to send your messages straight here into the studio. And any moment now, we will have our speakers that you've just saw in the auditorium join us live for a live debrief and a live Q&A. And let me also extend that invitation to our on-site audience. You are invited to ask your questions to the speakers as well. So, Stefan, what would you say should be the key implications in the clinical practice after watching this? How will I, and we talked a lot about in the beginning that it's really about the decision-making process of which therapies you choose. Can we try to summarize the key decision points here? I think we, we, we learned, or, or I as a clinician, I learned two things. If I choose to place an implant, I should deliberately think what is the right way to place it. Yeah. So when is yeah, it so good this is indication? actually of the end of the chain. Absolutely. If I've decided to go but also implant, coming back to that, um, it is interesting to see maybe we start too late because we start very very technology driven. We say, okay, the tooth is lost. Um, it's already done in our mind. Um, I cannot keep the tooth, and now I'm thinking of how to restore that situation with implants. Maybe um, this is at least what I learned. Take a step back. Maybe it's not lost, the tooth, and maybe not the implant is the only option, but there are different options. And I think what, what hasn't been addressed so much in that session, and I think that maybe we should bring up now, is the age of the patient. I mean, okay. of course, if, if you have an 80-year-old patient, probably the most simple, straightforward solution is probably the best solution. Why? And it doesn't come so much into aesthetics or whatever. But if you have a 20-year-old patient with a high lip line, maybe it, it is completely different. I mean, this is something maybe where I would pick a little bit on the, on the speaker's wounds and then later. Um, how does the age or the expectation of the patient drive us or, or make us differ our, our decision? I think this is important. But to, to, to conclude that, for me, two things. One thing is, if you place an implant, make sure you do diagnostics, you prepare yourself. And I think Homer made a very, very clear point. The most important thing is the positioning of the implant. Yeah. So you can do anything what you can. You can have the best implant system, whatever. If you place it too far to the buckle, if you place it too far to the neighboring tool, you're out. Yeah. You're out of the game. Yeah. It doesn't matter what kind of skills you have. And the second point Marcus made, which is, I think, also important is, well, let's go back from these technical aspects, go back to the more medical aspects, like treatment planning, diagnostics, like weighing of alternatives. I mean, this is a classical medical thing, what every physician, every dentist does. I mean, what is the best option in that case? Again, in my hands. I think this is also what we need to ask uh, the, the speakers. I mean, for example, an auto transplantation 
if you've never done this procedure, is it then better to place an, as to place an implant, what you probably do every day? So I think this also comes into play. I mean, how experienced are you with a speci specific treatment option? It's funny because we chatted before and, and uh, Stefan shared with me who is rooting for the tooth in an implant conference. Right. Are we maybe too much focused on implants here? I think, I think what, what Marcus made clear and I think I wouldn't say we're too much focused on implants. It could be the implant at the end. But I think we're, we're scratching out a lot of alternatives on, on our mind because for us the implant is the natural alternative for losing a tooth. Exactly. Why this is the case, I don't know. Probably it's very popular. There's a lot of research it's done easy, on that. It's fast. So it, 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 it seems to be easy. Uh, but so I think this is the point. This is the backbone. Is it's not the the decision you take at the end. And we will have to tackle Marcus because. I think he was a little too contra against the, against the implants. So um, it, it may be an implant at the end, but it is probably the decision process which you do beforehand. All right, well, Stefan, I think it's time to do that. If you're just joining us, this is the moment we've all been waiting for. The uh, theme of this conference is a bridge to the future, and we've just bridged the gap for our speakers to join us here in the studio. So Stefan, step one side again. If you're just joining us, this is Marcus Horsler, who is happy he delivered the speech, and Homer Day from Hello. the United Good States. Yes, Good to meet you again. Oh, look at that. Great friends. We should tell our audience you know each other from the past. You work together. <laughs> you've uh, met each other in the States. I know so this is a familiar done. crowd. Let me also extend again the invitation to the on-site audience. If you have questions to our speakers, please step in. I have a microphone. I'll get you on the air. So congratulations on the great session. We can see in the numbers, a lot of viewership was attracted and they stayed on. But obviously we have a little debrief to do. And uh, luckily, I'm just taking care of audience questions. I have Stefan on my side. So Stefan, we've been watching the session together. What is your first question that you want to throw on the table? Well, of course, first of all, congratulations to both of you. Beautiful session, beautiful educated <laughs> and entertaining also. <laughs> um, of course, w we foresaw a lot, a lot of the things you, you, you delivered. And I mean, I, I have to tackle you guys, of course. You tackled each other, and I will tackle you guys. I mean, Mark, I mean, don't you see too black for the implants? I mean, uh, you told us there are only alternatives. I but counted them. Seven <laughs> alternatives you gave to implants <laughs> in the aesthetic zone. You but know, but don't you see too black? Isn't, shouldn't we put it like this? I mean, there are seven alternatives, but isn't the implant restoration one of these alternatives? Shouldn't we put it like this? Shouldn't in we the have end, eight? Of course, you have a. A, a, a treatment process, but at the end, it could also be the implant, but I think we should think of alternatives. Yeah, but my, to my topic was the alternatives. I agree. So I have to speak about alternatives. The other thing now, I'm business over 35 years, you know that, and if you don't make the point very clear and you are very strict, people will not notice it. So once we have, at the moment, it's time to sensibilize ourselves in this direction. And if you want to make changes and make things change their mind about treatment planning, then you have to be like this, black or white. I agree with you. Implant is a good option. You know I do a lot of implants, but I do lesser and lesser implants. And to give the message to the participants here, it's important to make it clear. Otherwise, they will not think about it. I agree, but I'm not interested in your opinion as a speaker. I'm interested in your opinion as a clinician. Yeah, that's it's what I did. But just listen, you have seen my last case. This was my daughter. And in my daughter, she's 20. You know my daughter well, she's 28. I would never place an implant today. This is clear the option I would go. So in a young patient, and for me, he's young, 40, 45, we need to be more careful. After that, I completely agree with you. Let's, let's turn that to your co-speaker. Homa, what were you thinking? With all these alternatives on the table, would you place an implant in your daughter yeah. in the aesthetic zone? As a clinician, it's always about risk assessment. You always have to go through the process of risk assessment, understand what are the elements of the risk for each patient, discuss with the patient, and go with a plan that works for that particular patient. So yes, we have alternatives, we have implants, it's always discussed with the patient, and at the end, a treatment is selected that works well for that particular patient. 
but I think uh, the option we, you know, one, where I disagree with Marcus is that age is not always a predictor for what you describe as a craniofacial growth because what you describe has been actually shown to occur in the same degree in the younger and older group. There was a study, I think it was out of UK, that showed that young and old patients had the exact same amount of infra-occlusion of uh, implants versus to adjacent teeth. So uh, whether you do it for young or old, I think that there's still gonna be a complication. I had a patient in his 60s who had the infra-occlusion of an implant yeah, that was true. placed in like uh, 10 years before and 50s, I repositioned that implant with segmental osteotomy, and again, the same thing happened to that implant. The second time, it went into infraocclusion uh, for a patient in the 60s. So that could be a complication for any patient at any age, so. Yeah, but there is aesthetic, not a problem. But one thing I want to emphasize here, and this we have to be clear. When you take the patient too much in the decision what he wants to do, then it's very biased because you will convert the patient what you like to do. That's typical, that is shown in the literature, yeah. that every clinician- Yeah, you have your favorite you treatment You have a favorite option. treatment, and you guide the patient in direction. This is very dangerous, and that's why I- What, what is the danger, Marcus? Because we because we've learned you from- Because you will do that what you like to do. Yes. And Matthias Kern, our professor about resin bond bridge, he would ever always do a resin bond bridge. He tends more to implant. But my thing, what I, the message I wanted to give my lecture was, when you take each patient as the most important person in your life, like my daughter, then you start to think a little bit different. And you try not to be biased with what you favor. Then you think about, he would think about, maybe I sent this patient to Professor Kern, who is doing a great resin bonded bridge to a specialist like this. And he would think about perio. You would say, oh, I can do better, better so, than so this Marcus, guy. So this is dangerous. Marcus, reading between the lines here, the fact that you feel that you have to bring this message to this conference basically assumes that now, in the case, you think that dentists and, and people around us are not thinking about their patient as the most important person in their life. It's always said like he. Omar is right. I mean, always we say today when we, we treat about, uh, we discuss about treatment planning, we say we have to discuss it with the patient. I, the only point I want to make, I agree with that, but the only point I want to make, we have to be careful discussing with a patient different treatment options because the patient doesn't know anything. We, we touched I mean, on the patient perspective before. I yeah. mean, I, Homa, I'd like to ask you one question. I mean, Marcus made it a little black and white and saying infra occlusion is a problem and we saw that horrible case with the lateral incisor. Um, is, is that true? Do we see so many of these infra positioned implants over 20 years? I mean, otherwise, wh why are we still doing implants? I mean, what, what is your... What is your experience? What is your experience? I, I do agree that uh, it is a p possible uh, complication. I also practice with uh, a prosthodontist Daftari who did actually one of the publications in this area. And we do see that, but the amount, I think, is not always there. It depends on the facial skeleton, and also it depends on the patient. So I would say that it's, it's not always a complication, but we do, you know, it's part of our consent form for the patient for the anterior area to inform them that that's a possibility. But I disagree that you have to involve the patient. Patients actually are smarter than we think. Give them credit. We are biased. Every clinician brings their personal bias, but I think the patient needs to be a participant in the sure. decision-making process. Sure. Otherwise, agree. you know, they say it's your implant, and if it fails, it's your implant, but no. it's the patient's. But you have to be careful with including the patient in the treatment plan. That's what I mean. We have to be careful with this expression because everybody is doing that. So you, so you say there's a difference? between including in a sense that you inform them very well about the risk and the options, but not including in what is the best treatment for you. I mean, it's even psychologically, in the psychological literature, you can read about that, what I just said, that you will bias the patient in the direction you want, will guide the patient there. Mm -hmm. But I, I completely agree. I also want to take the patient in my decision, but I just want to make you think a little bit before you do that, that you really look at all the option and you may have a different change in your mind when you think this patient is so important in my life that's 
I mean, thing I, I mean, the point we made, and I, I think that maybe concludes it a little bit, is we see a failing tooth, and the first thing we think is of titanium. And I think that was your point. Take a step back. I mean, there are other options, and maybe you end up placing an implant because you took a deliberative uh, decision to do that. Mm -hmm. But take a step back and, and don't vote for the first option which comes to, my to your mind. I think this is, I think, what, what we see a little bit in your, in your it's lecture. Not, it's not easy to convince this group here to think a little bit about not placing an implant in the aesthetic zone. Let's see. I mean, the only thing, I have one more point, yeah, maybe yeah, get ready yeah. if you allow yeah. me, which, yes. which I would tackle you both, because I mean, of course we all know, and Homer beautifully showed that, that it's always sophisticated to place an implant in the aesthetic sound. However, my, my dear friend, I would say it's quite sophisticated to do an autotransplantation in the aesthetic zone. So what about an, an experienced surgeon who does a lot of implants, who is experienced with an implant? Does this also make a difference in, in, in the, in the regimen, in, in the treatment strategy? If I'm very experienced with implants in the aesthetic zone, of course, complications can happen. But isn't then this probably the better option for me than doing the first time in my life for autotransplantation? When you have more experience with this treatment, that's what you are going to do. You will bias the patient and say this is better. But which but is not bad, because but I'm it's more not experienced bad. It's not bad if you have a lot of experience and you do a good job, but we have to be a little bit more honest, and you know this, as good as I know, what we see on the screen all the time, is this the daily reality? This is always my question. Right. So and you're saying we're driving each other crazy with the best success cases? They show us the nice, I, I do. I also show you the nice cases. The best cases you have, he too, 100%. He will show you the best cases, let's be honest. Did you, with you. <laughs> He's I a showed, human being. I showed average case. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but but, but Homer, what is your take? He's a human being like everybody. What here. is your take on that? Would you rather go for a, a procedure where you think, okay, it is a, a critical case, it is difficult to restore aesthetics, or would you say, okay, it's possible with another option, but I don't have so much experience as a clinician? Uh, absolutely. I think a lot of the market, uh, options that Marcus illustrated are equally technically challenging. Mm. To do a perfect endo, to do a perfect restoration, the, that palatal implant to cantilever that, I guarantee you most labs to fabricate that, they're gonna make something that every week the patient is gonna show up with a fracture. And so that's your problem in the United States. Yeah, <laughs> well, but, but, but that's this is safe, but we have to think about our treatment plan because our lab techniques are not so good. But that's a reality that's every a day, reality, yeah. right? That's true. So everything is, there's no simple uh, option. I think it's really, you have to weigh all of the options. But you have, when you do an implant, you have three surgery. Right. And this is every time a right. risk. When I do, like, like Irena showed, what I also would favor, one, soft tissue augmentation, pontic site development, that's it. This is less risky than do three surgery, for well, sure. But for you, but if you take someone who is not skilled at that, they could do a soft tissue augmentation, get a sloughed and get nothing out of yeah, but that. But then they get sloughed right? if they implant anyhow, because right. at the implant they have to play soft tissue too, as so you said. I think so they have always problems. The reality doing. is that everything is challenging, right? There's no simple solution. Clinical dentistry in the aesthetic zone is challenging in all aspects. So we can't say, these are the simple solution, implant is the no, hard solution, no, it's, right? It's, it's I, would, I would like to go back a little bit more to the technical aspects. I mean, you showed your decision process about immediate implant versus delayed. So can we put it that simple? No buckle bone, no immediate implant? Uh, in most situations, yes. Mm -hmm. In most situations, I think it's more predictable, at least in my view, to place the implant in a delayed fashion if it's uh, not a facial bone. But, do I, is it always? No, there are some patients that, uh, you know, for a patient who's older and uh, you don't want to put them through multiple procedure, it's not aesthetically challenging, low lip line, you could do uh, simultaneous. But typically I would prefer to do a delay. We are in front of a backdrop of the beautiful city of Lisbon. This is, this is symbolic for the fact that we're also talking to two people from two very big continents with a large pond in between. We're bridging gaps here. <laughs> Earlier yeah, today, uh, yeah, I know. Earlier <laughs> today, we talked about, and we also touched upon that a little bit, about the difference in the Americas yeah. and, and the European side. Do you recognize a, a difference in style and philosophy in the Americas being more progressive, uh, more aggressive, more 
go fast and maybe Basically, on this side. We have more cowboys in the US. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah? Thank you. But, but Stefan, I like this answer. This, 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 this might be related to this context of both your patients right. and perhaps liability issues and all these kind of soft pressures going for implants and going for immediate. What, what is your take on that? Well, I think uh, US, uh, you know, I think came to implant dentistry a little bit later, uh, you know, which is kind of surprising. We have a lot of novice clinicians. So I would say the average number of clinicians performing implant therapy are the novice clinicians. Okay. And that's really plays into the complications that we face because they think an anterior area is easy access that would do it for the first implant. And that's where we see a lot of the complications. So I think the experience of the clinician is very important in this. So I do see the difference. I think um, in Europe, I see more efforts to try to save teeth. I, 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 but also in different countries, I, I find that some countries are more conservative than others, even in Europe. And is conservative the right term, Marcus, if we focus on saving teeth? He's Swiss, very conservative. Swiss, I'm Swiss, so I'm very conservative. Yeah, he's right, so. Well, but I, I realize there's a, oh, there's the a, there's it's a the matter of labeling the wording, here. The exactly. Wording, if it's really conservative. Maybe so it's, it's actually progressive more to progressive save progressive teeth. for the future, I agree with you. Yeah. It's yeah. a yeah. future thinking, in my opinion, too. Let's take one of our uh, viewer questions. It came in early already. It was uh, Doc Andre Chen, who is watching us actually here from, uh, from Portugal. And he asked, is there any evidence or any research being done on the effect of new biomaterials like zirconia and the effect on implants in the aesthetic zone? Is there any relation, anything being searched there? Uh, there is a lot in Germany going on with zirconia implant. This is the country of the zirconia implant. But uh, looking at the research, we need to be careful. The evidence is n it's not there yet, what people say, that this is better regarding the aesthetic outcome, not at all. Regarding the soft tissue integration, there's no evidence at the moment to support this. Is, is it to be expected, though? You also rooted on stage, we shouldn't be always evidence-based. So, so what mechanisms are at work here, why we could expect better outcome? But this is, I mean, I don't know how it's in the United States, but you're also very much now in the zirconium oxide implant. I think zirconia has been in Europe, especially in Germany, yeah. far longer than it's been yeah, in yeah. the States. But I don't think it's always a good thing to be an early adopter of anything. I'd rather wait for <laughs> the complications to arise uh, for That's other people. Fair. I think for research is perfectly fine, but in my pr clinic, I don't want to have the complications show up in my clinic as a first early adopter, so but I would wait usually. Isn't it also, I mean, probably what you guys saw over your experience, that it's most of the times never the material. It is probably your hands, how you're trained. We see that in the studies with the center effect. I mean, it's probably not a material per se which will give us a solution for, for these problems. I'm pretty right? sure that the ceramic implant works good, but uh, there are other risks. We have to learn them again, and it's too fast. It comes too fast on the market, and it's before we have any evidence. And yes, in, uh, in Germany, they do it over the population. It's a very, very clever marketing. They learn it from the United States. Now they go to the patient and they sensibilize the patient that titanium is worse for them than the zirconium. So this is the marketing. So here again, we have our patient. And then the, the patient with comes the to you plan. and says, I want a zirconium implant because I have heard in the media that this is better for soft tissue, this is better for the bone and so on. But all these data are at the moment missing and we, have, we should be careful. Uh, but this is another strategy we are in and we have to be careful as a profession, as a professional group, not to follow too fast all these things which comes from the media and from Instagram and from all these things. We be careful. But if a patient comes yeah. in and wants a zirconia implant, that's normally yeah. a good sign that you don't want this patient, <laughs> right? <'Cause> <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it tells you that this patient is very sensitive. You have to be careful exactly. what you are going well to do. Well educated, Dr. Right. Google yeah. is on the side. He's Google, yeah. he's right. Google educated. Yes. I call this Google yeah. or the Instagram or whatever, internet educated. There yeah, you have to be careful. He's I like this expression, what he just said. Talking about uh, Instagram and YouTube, we are live on the EEO channel and we have Ibrahim Samir Rabe who's joining us. I don't see from where, but he's very thankful for your story. He wants to congratulate you and he concludes it 
as that it's basically a matter of multidisciplinary teamwork. That's the answer to all it's, of this. It's, uh, Do you agree, Homa? Yes. Glad. Otherwise, we could have a light debate. Yeah. But it actually also brings us to the end of this half hour debrief. So uh, thank you very much for your active participation. Thank you very much for joining us here on the EO channel. Thank you, Oma Zadeh. Safe uh, Congress and safe travels back to the thank US. You. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, Stefan, for my being pleasure. my expert pleasure. co host. And I hope Excellent. by now you've All already right. hit that subscribe button yeah. here on the EO channel. And make sure you tune in back with us either tomorrow morning, 8 30 Portugal time, which is 9 30 in the rest of Europe, and in the afternoon in the Far East for a breakfast news. And later tomorrow at around 10.30, we will cover live the plenary session number two, I'm still busy, Marcus, about how to treat cases involving buccal bone loss after extraction. So I hope to see you back here tomorrow.